Happy Monday, Yo. everybody. Hi. Let's show you guys this. Ooh, Dark Pattern. Oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. Ooh. Is that the fourth one? Uh-huh. Creative Cloud Files. Ooh, what's in there? What? <laughs> I, I've, I've like, a couple times I've looked over at my notepad and seen, like, not that I put passwords there, but I've seen, you know, people might think were passwords mm -hmm. to important stuff open in my notepad. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, yeah, if I'm going to be doing a live recording, I should probably not be in the habit of leaving those out in the open. Yeah. <laughs> not that anything bad has ever happened to anybody live streaming with, like, you know, images open on their desktop. Uh, hey, so the uh, just before you joined us, just before we went live, uh, we had a, a, a fascinating surprise. You know, the, the, the guy in Spaceballs, when they're combing the desert, he says, we ain't found shit. Remember that guy? Mm hmm You know who that is? That is Tuvok from Voyager. Oh, that's funny. Tim Russ. Huh. Is that amazing? Yeah. I mean, in the scheme of discoveries that think cool things you told me, Brian, it's cool, but it's not like, you know, the coolest. It's a four... I mean, like, what, like I, 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 has there been a real rush on cool things that happened within the last five minutes? Like, I, yeah, feel, I don't like, know. I feel like I feel like it wins the day. <laughs> oh well, you haven't seen the list of stories I got. Ooh. Fair, fair point. Andrew quickly tries to type up like Star Trek trivia and crossovers <laughs> and stuff. No, Google's was, good stories. Yeah, I, I think that's crazy. I would never know. I, I figured that. I, I, I get, that's one of those things where it's like. Uh, uh, it's not that it's necessarily the craziest thing in the world. It's like, all right, a black actor does two sci-fi roles. But it also is something that I assumed I would have known, and yet I didn't until right now. See, we're teaching people every day, every minute, every day. You know, it, but it is once – it's interesting when you start to dive deep. Like, like uh, um, I was watching uh, Superman 1, and there's John Ratzenberger. Right, and then I uh, and you know John Ratzenberger is like in Star Wars, or he's like an Empire, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, he's an Empire. He's one of the the uh, yeah. rebel officers. He pops up in Superman one in one role. Then you watch Superman two, and there he is in another role. And then I'm watching Superman two, and I'm like, Hey, who's who's the terrorist trying to blow up the Eiffel? T Harry Potter's uncle. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, Oh, jeez, it's. It's like these actors existed before the thing I knew them for, <laughs> you know, and that's that's kind of that realization when you start you see once you've seen enough actors and you start watching stuff, you're like, oh, wow, you know, that's so and so. And that's that's this person from here. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was something I was watching the other day. Uh, oh, I was in uh, I was in the theater watching the pre-show for. Uh, oh, Booksmart. The, the Olivia Wilde movie Booksmart mm. and they play they were playing old like romantic comedy um, and like teenage coming of age um, movie trailers in the Alamo pre-show mm -hmm. and they were playing one that was like um, it was Olivia Wilde and uh, uh, the main guy from Office Space um, uh, yeah I know who you're talking about uh, yeah um Ron Livingston? Yeah. Ron Livingston. Yeah. Uh, and oh, some other – who was the other person? It, it was a bunch of a bunch of actors that I knew. Oh, Drinking uh, Buddies. Yeah. Yeah, that's I think that's a, it. That's on that movie. Yeah, Anna Kendrick and Jake Johnson. I, Kendrick, I walked yeah. by the Arclight – or not – yeah, the Arclight when they were doing the premiere for that one day. I come out to go see a movie, and there's everybody lined up and all that, the red carpet for Drinking Buddies. Yeah, it was, I'm like, what's this? Yeah, it was just weird because I was like, that feels like a big get now, but that was yeah. 2013. Hey, uh, have you looked up Tim Russ's I am uh, his Wikipedia and for his filmography? Mm, no, but I will. Go take a look at that for Spaceballs. All right, here we go. Spaceballs, the guy who said we ain't found shit. <laughs> <laughs> And Brian's like vindicated. <laughs> Man, I don't even know what you want at this point. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Uh, um, yeah, man. I'll tell you what, it's a spoiler alert for my pick, but uh, after a, a text message from Andrew Main on Sunday, I watched all of season three of Documentary Now, uh, mm-hmm. which felt like it was kind of a, a, a return to form for that show. That was a, kind of more what I thought season two was going to be like. What do uh, what are some of the topics or some of the I guess the parodies? They do a, they do a wild wild country parody? They do a the like Maria Abramovich, uh, the artist is uh, present, present mm-hmm. uh, parody. Um, with Kate Blanchett doing an amazing job. Right. Oh. I was two minutes, three, a couple minutes in. I'm like, wait, is that Kate Blanchett? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. What else? They had the uh, a great showcase for Fred Armisen. You had the uh, searching for Mr. Lar- looking for Mr. Larson. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The one making fun of the 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 Calvin and Hobbes, the guy who went looking for the Calvin and Hobbes guy, but this one he's looking for Gary Larson from the far side. <laughs> and it's it's like and it just and it's kind of like kind of it's just commentary on that documentary filmmaking style where you put yourself at the center of how narcissistic it really can be. And that, that's the thing kind of sometimes turns me off where it's like, you see this person on the cover and they're doing something like I went out to go look into this thing. It's like, so it's going to be a bunch of cool experts talking about this and what, like, Nope, I'm the center. (laughs) (laughs) Me, 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 (laughs) you know? Uh, Yeah. And it, it goes, it goes hard at that idea and where it's place in our culture and how it is Kickstarter uh, and, and, and yeah. uh, but uh yeah no that one was great you God. know there, 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 there's there, there's always every documentary now season has the obligatory we're gonna watch Fred Armisen play music um episode oh sure which but, <laughs> but that was what I like was the twist. Like I felt like this. Like the the searching for Mr. Larson one. I guess was actually from season two, and then they pushed it into this one. Oh really? Oh. Yeah. But the other ones. But like I liked. I felt like there was more of. I like it when they parody, and then it goes. It gets. It's not just straight up aping something when it subverts the thing. And I didn't feel season two subverted enough. Yeah. And that was my problem with. Uh, uh, batshit country was like that story's so friggin' wild. It, it, it's there's nothing you can make up and put into the real story. It's hard I mean, to hyperbolize. Nothing you can make up put into the, into the fake one that if yeah. it turned out in the real one, you wouldn't be like, oh yeah, I guess that happened too. Yeah, I see. I've not I've not seen Wild Wild Country yet, so so not being familiar with that story, except knowing that like it's about a bunch of you know a cult that just kind of like uh, appears you know next to this town and has uh these uh you know the 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 back and forth with with the locals um i i certainly can just i i appreciated it just for the the fact that their their cult leader is owen wilson and uh it takes some takes some funny turns did i did i tell you my personal connection to that whole thing the cult and all that No, no but yeah but you lived up around there when you were growing up right so that we we lived in Oregon around the time of the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. My father, uh, uh, my, my father's friend was an investigator. I was like chief of prosecutor, or whatever, who actually is one of the people they tried to poison and tried to kill. You know, in front of my dad's. Oh, yeah. um, you know, this whole town, like trying to like take over Antelope, Oregon. They were putting you know poison in the salad bar. So I, I got and because they had firearms and stuff, they had to go do. They would do stuff like. Uh, there would be like a sheriff's convention, and they would send the the. They had this. The Bhagwan had like this full-on like female police department and they he would send them off to like police conventions and stuff and have them sleep with as many like sheriffs and police you know departments as they could because that way they could just build up evidence like crazy and i don't know i never made it through the whole thing but that kind of stuff was going on but then when we went we moved to florida and my my freshman year i had a teacher and i I don't want to i had an english teacher who I didn't kind of get along with, and I was kind of in my experimental writing phase. And this was a gifted writing class, 
and she calls my parents in for a press conference, a pre- parent conference. A press con- <laughs> she was very, very dramatic. She calls my parents in for, a, uh, you know, for a conference, and she tells my dad, like, your son is illiterate. Oh. <laughs> and, she, and then my dad's like, my dad, my dad's not always going to take my side. If I do something stupid, he won't. But I'm like, I had a perfect, you know, I had a perfect verbal score on the California Achievement Test and whatever. The perfect verbal score, all of that. You know all this, and my you know my teacher gives him one of my dad my papers. My dad reads this, and it's like it's me doing my you know my fourteen year old hacky version of Kurt Vonnegut stream of consciousness or something like this. Ah, yeah. And my dad gets what this is, and he looks at her. She's dressed all in red, and she has these beads. And he goes, uh, "Are you Rajni?" <laughs> You know, just like, oh, yeah. And my dad was, she she was one of the disciples of the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, you know. And it's like, oh, wow. everything I need to know right there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. You know, it's like, it was so funny. My dad's like, wait a second. You're, you remember that crazy freaking cult, you know. That's fucking She was a very wild. nice lady, though. Oh, I'm sure. Salt of the earth. <laughs> All righty. Uh, I'm good over here. Are you good, Andrew? Yeah. Yeah? All right. You guys good? Ready to rock. Yeah. All right. Take it away in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello. Brian Brushwood. Uh, hello. Hopefully, we won't get struck by lightning. It's very thundery outside. <laughs> well... That's all up to the next man, Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Thankfully, we have a, we didn't used to have this like a year ago, but we have a little power supply system. So if stuff breaks down, we can save some of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, it used to be like we were we were riding, we were flying without a net at all times. Yeah. So if you hear that a beeping, was necessity that's necessity in Florida was the the power supply thing because of the lightning strikes and all that. You know, if you didn't have a UPS attached to your your computer system. It was like, like. I don't know, not using penicillin. Yeah, you're just trying to raw dog the internet. Hey, man, yeah. either you have a UPS or you say, oops. Oh. Yeah, see, see, see what I did there? Yeah. That says free marketing advice. Yeah. I know I should have saved that for after things. <laughs> you should have saved that for the bumper stickers. That you, you know, you're, you're, stuck with a, uh, you're stuck with a whole warehouse full of unsold. <laughs> you either use a UPS or say, oops, bumper stickers. <laughs> You can sell that to the United Postal Service. <laughs> yeah, either way. On that, yeah. Go, yeah. Or, or to pick So I want, to, I want to jump right into the next story. Um, oh, pardon oh, sleepy me. Sleepy boy. Sorry. Uh, I just get so tired of reading this. World's most powerful rockets going to launch tonight. The Falcon Heavy, where they recover all three boosters. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> now, the, hold on. Now, thing. hold on. There's plenty to be excited about this time, Andrew, because for the yeah. first time, they're deploying, I believe it's it's seven different satellites in seven different orbits. Is that right? They're launching they're, yeah, multiple payloads, and I'm kind of excited because I helped back one of these payloads. Oh, wow. Like, uh, it, was it a Kickstarter? Yep, for the Planetary Society for the light sail. And the, so, oh, the, and the uh, light sail is testing for the ability to use solar sails as a method of propulsion to, between the planets and stars? Yes, sir. So the Planetary Society funded a mission on Kickstarter, of which you know, I've, I've got the T-shirt. And what it is is they want to test exactly that. They have a CubeSat that's going to be one of the – and this is, the, this is not the most important payload. Well, it is to me. But basically, if you go to the Planetary Society dot, planetary.org, you can see a video of this. And it's really awesome as you see how the thing unfurls and whatnot. Um, and uh, they have an animation that plays, I think, on the main planetary.org site. And you can see the thing unfurling and whatnot. And they're going to give this, I think they, they, this is the version two, and they're improving upon the last one, which I think had some deployment issues. And so this is going to be one of the many cool things going on with this. So, and it's one of the cool things. Uh, this this is a it's a CubeSat tiny satellite and all it's going to do is robotically extend some arms with and uh, to the casual observer it looks like tin foil but it's you know some kind of space mylar or whatever and all I guess 
They're... All it's going to do for those of us that don't have our own show like Modern Rogue, where we push the boundaries every day. <laughs> no, 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 no. What I'm saying, look, uh, uh, don't un un misunderstand simple for extraordinary. I mean, they, the, the two are not mutually exclusive. It, 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 I assume that what they're doing is just unfurling a big sail and then they get to just measure how well it works uh, to, by catching and riding the solar winds. That's the plan. That's the plan is to yeah, deploy this into sea. Solar solar sails have the advantage of you don't really need to have any fuel unless you want to have some small fuel or you want to have some little ion thruster to help you steer a bit and take advantage, as you pointed out, the solar winds. And you can get up to significant velocities. You know, you could, you know, escape velocity for the solar system, et cetera. And so it's it's a very interesting way to try to do this. We have new, really, really cool new materials that are extremely lightweight, yet pretty strong and very reflective and able to, you know, capture that. And so this is going to be a cool test of this. Yeah, it makes me wonder when we get to a post scarcity society where AI robots are able to build other AI robots and we could just sort of issue one directive. Let's say let's say we're at a place where all humans can be fed and taken care of and medicined to uh, the extent that they all want to be. And, and meanwhile, you are able to have entire planets being harvested by robots or whatever. It makes sense to if we're at a place where we wanted to reach out beyond the stars. I, I guess I'm trying to think of like a, a mega Voyager possibility on this mm -hmm. where, where for, for a thousand years, robots do nothing but but build you know, version 89.5 of the golden record, stick it on these things and then just let the solar winds carry it out to the stars in so many ways we would be just doing what what a, a dandelion does yep yep i mean that's that's once you get the cost down low enough and you know you can just continuously send things out and explore and that's that's kind of a very exciting thing and the accessibility like this is privately funded you know this is this is the planetary society is funding a you know a deep space mission now granted you're like oh well it's only you know it's a tiny little thing but like, well this is where it starts folks Sure, yeah. And uh, is this one uh, of the seven satellites, or are all seven satellites different light sails? Uh, I, oh, I believe no, there are yeah, se seven they're, different... They're, I think there's many more than seven satellites, but there are seven different orbits that they have to hit, including some of uh, some really far-out ones that are used for military purposes, so that uh, basically the success of this, if I'm remembering the article correctly, uh, the success of this mission will directly uh, affect whether or not they get one of the two lucrative contracts, military contracts for the next however many years with the uh, with the Air Force. It's like them versus ULA versus, you know, Boeing and so on. Or I guess Boeing yeah, is Yeah, that's the real, the real missions launching government hardware in there. This is just a sort of little bonus, like, hey, yeah, I've got a, you know, front seat's empty. You want it? You know? Yeah, they are, they are basically, uh, uh, on one hand, the real money is in those contracts. It's like a freight program, but they also want to be Uber pool where people yeah. can, you know, spend a, a far lower amount of money and, and take advantage of the fact that these rockets are taken off at a very regular clip. And that also saves money theoretically for the government that they're able to offer a more competitive uh, rate because theoretically it would be cheaper to do. Uh, a correction on my numbers. It's 24 different payloads on three different orbits. And that's significant because they're going to release however many on the first one, and then they have to restart the engine a second time, and then a third time, and then of course, um, uh, I, I guess, will they will they bring back home the the second stage? Has are, are we at that point yet? Oh, uh, the upper stage. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, so then, but, that, but this this actually this this burn because it's going so much further out. It's it's. The upper stage is going to probably most likely definitely do a burn up in the atmosphere and, wow. and not just not only crash to the ocean, but like, you know, like smash. So apparently by then. this is the first time the Air Force is allowing its payloads to be on previously used rockets. So it's kind of the other side. They, Man, that's crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's but that's yeah that's amazing that it's like all right well once you normalize that once you normalize the idea that like all right well we're, we are reusing rockets and spacex is kind of the only game in town for that uh then that's huge because if they're willing to do that then you have unlocked a huge competitive advantage yep um so in other news this is a follow-up on a story from we covered i think the week before and i don't know good news bad news um 
remember how we talked about the Strato launch? It looked like they were kind of going out of business. Yeah, on account yeah. Of, of having nothing but a crazy Spruce Goose uh, plane to show for it. Well, a, a, a plane that's for sale. <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I the don't know. The largest airplane can be yours for about the budget of, I don't know, a Justice League movie with reshoots. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Could you imagine being in a position? That doesn't go to a private collector, right? Do you think somebody figures out a use for this thing? Uh, <laughs> we've got a bid in from Iran. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> uh, well, that's the problem is that you, you know, what, what, who wants to, cause like, I think they're asked like 400 million and, or, you know, like, okay, who wants to drop $400 million plus God knows how much more to maintain and keep this thing going versus if you said well we're really into the idea of a very i mean it depends you're really buying up you, you really want to be i think you want to buy a program you know yeah because it's it's a one-off and one-offs are you know you, you you need to it's not like you just get this thing and it runs there's a lot of maintenance a lot of other things going I, th on. I think lawn makes has it in the chat we just need to ask if they'll take a suit of armor and trade because if you <laughs> if we're trading cool cool crap i mean we we got some cool crap yeah. Um, yes, Brian, though, just imagine the shipping on that, though. That, <laughs> that's, and again, yeah. Turns out you're like, well, just fly it on over. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. You, you, you're going to have to pack it up and ship it. <laughs> yeah. Brian hires his, another task rabbit to see what it's going to cost from the pack and ship and <laughs> you know, down the street. Uh, 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 47 uh, helicopters are just lifting up this giant <laughs> UPS box. <laughs> That is a yeah. big one, man. That is that is wild. But but I, I I I'm curious to see if it does sell because like like, like you guys said, it's it really is it, it's too expensive to just kind of like buy and like you know have hanging out somewhere. But it's not quite what you would want for that kind of money if you were trying to get into the space game. Well, and that's the thing is nobody would. I mean, nobody except for the people who did would design would choose this from scratch as their first option to uh, to solve any number of problems. And then, in other words, whatever thing you would want to do with this, almost certainly there would be cheaper, more cost effective ways to do that thing than even buying at pennies on the dollar of investment. This particular piece of history. Yeah, the. The, you know, the advantage of this is we've talked about before, the strata launch plane is capable of putting rockets into multiple orbits. And there's there's there are advantages to that strategy. But yeah, but it's like, you know, when you're looking at a half a billion dollar investment and you're like, yeah, um, do I do that? Or, you know, if I'm an aerospace company, do I just put that money into my own rapidly reusable technology and, and go that way? Because, you know, you here's the problem with this thing, too, is you got one. You got one airplane. This thing crashes. There ain't going to be another. Oof. I'm sure it's easy to get insurance on that kind of thing too, right? Yeah, exactly. Replacement value. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, we'll see. I don't know. I mean, you know, who knows? You know, uh, and I, you know, you know. Apparently, Richard Branson offered to buy it for one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Get in the game. Just get in the game. I mean, that that is a savvy opening bid. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, I, per, was it was it Peter Teal's Teal's book uh, Zero to One? Apparently, he had just read that. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, here's here's the strategy to that is that it's one of these things where you're like, oh, well, you know, what's the value of this? Well. Right now, it's taking up space. It's costing, you know, Strata Launch and the people in charge of Vulcan Ventures, which is the parent company of all that, are looking at line items of how much this thing costs, you know, what's it going to cost every year for maintenance or what's it going to cost every year to keep this thing and et cetera. And, and there's a point at some point in the future where you go, that cost far exceeds whatever value you think you're going to recoup. And... You know, things happen like that. People come in and, you know, do lowball offers on stuff before. Like, oh, and think about... I think Branson tried to buy the Concorde. 
the, you know, the, the remaining Concords when they were going to pull those out of service. I have another wrinkle on this that I don't think we've tied together. So it's like in our mind, uh, I think we can all imagine maybe maybe a hundred or a, a thousand multi-billionaires that might do this as a vanity thing. But there's another external pressure in that over the last 10 to 15 years, it's become very fashionable if you're a multi-billionaire to try to out um, uh, out donate the rest of your crowd and that's the new status symbol so it's like now you have to think to yourself okay do i want to be the badass who spent 400 million on a plane that will probably never fly or do i want to be the badass that spent 400 million on this cause that uh, that that now this disease is eradicated in my name and all of a sudden th that makes this an even less attractive offer yeah, I think that the, the biggest issue is just figuring out exactly what you're going to do with it. And that's why like a dollar, you know, a dollar purchase of the hardware is interesting if there's at least a commitment to do something and there's a commitment to keep it going. Uh, so uh, it, it, I, I don't think it's, it's you know, as uh, insulting as, as somebody might initially think to be like, oh, really, they want 400 million? He's offering a dollar uh, because if he's actually going to do something with it, then that's good. I mean, I think that's ultimately what the spirit of that project would, would thrive on. Yeah, well, you know what? I hadn't thought about that as it being a semi-serious thing, which is by a $1 bid, uh, I would say in the entire planet, the most natural fit to buy this and to actually use it would be Richard Branson because this this could be retrofitted with the Spaceship One design. Well, and they that... had, had plans. They were actually going to work on – they had an agreement with Straddle Launch actually to develop oh. hardware to fly on. So, so a $1 bid essentially becomes a, a, a real way to communicate, I have genuine interest, your initial offer is crazy, let's talk. Yeah. And that's what – uh, you know, who knows? Who, who knows how this kind of I don't think any of us move in the kind of circles uh, uh, that a 400 million dollar massive mega plane that could bring you access to space uh, would uh, would, you know, th these conversations are being had in. But, uh, yeah, if, if, if somebody's looking to continue the mission, then absolutely. Um, well, I'm we, sorry. We in for two dollars. Oh, uh, let me correct this. Uh it wasn't Virgin Galactic. Again, there things changed. It, the Virgin Galactic wasn't who they had, they were going to launch. Virgin Galactic was building, looking to build their own much larger space plane too at some point, I believe. But uh, Orbital ATK, um, and then uh, so that was I think who was going to they wanted to use it with, and then I think Aerojet Rocketdyne. So there's a couple of these other companies that were going to planning to put payloads on them. That might be who they were sort of kind of like floating this out there to. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I want maybe maybe this is just a uh, an anchoring tactic to to make sure that that the I man at some point I'll bet this does sell. You guys want to lock in our our prices right guesses as to what it goes for? Um, I think that it'll be hard to sort of put a specific price on it because it'll probably be like some sort of partnership agreement with whoever is most further along and wanted to use it between like Rocketdyne or Orbital ATK. Because oh, because you probably like would a, want to uh, acquire all the talent that was in the creation and maintenance yeah, and running of it. And it might be like a profit sharing agreement or whatever, like a new – and basically if you're the people trying to handle Vulcan Ventures, you're like, we want to get this off the books. And we want, you know, if we can declare revenue positive, whatever, they can say, okay, you guys are in charge of a new venture. We own 40% whatever profits are yielded from it, blah, 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 you know. And then you write off the value or whatever. Yeah. And, and there was also another too, which was they were, Stratolaunch was working on, apparently never built though, was Black Ice, which was going to be their own basically space shuttle sized orbiter craft that was going to, supposed to be able to launch from there. Oh, wow. Which, you know, there's a lot of intellectual property there that has value. So, you know, uh, it just the price is pretty hefty. But yeah, if you're, you know, it, it, it is interesting how little price matters when you factor in all the other negotiating points there are. Like I, I didn't consider the potential to uh, continue to per participate in the profits or revenues of whoever acquires it going forward. And like at some point, some number of talented engineers thrown into the deal on an ongoing basis, you end up at a place where 400 million seems like a fine price tag, but I, I don't know that they even have enough of that talent to include in the deal. Man. Well, 
I think this is a crazy thing. You want to know what else is crazy? Everybody who supports us at patreon.com slash weird things. Now, 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 don't get all fired up. When I say crazy, I don't mean mentally disturbed. I mean enthusiastic about this kind of off-kilter science discussion that we have minted on Weird Things, the podcast and live stream. Folks, head on over there right now, patreon.com slash weird things, and make sure that we keep coming back each and every Monday morning, giving you the kind of scientific and news of the weird talk that you crave. Patreon.com slash weird things is also where you can get our After Things uh, podcast before anybody else. We talk about all the projects that not only we are working on, but also you guys can email in as well. Head on over and chat us up. Patreon.com slash weird things. You know what's cool about that is you can do that at any time you want. Sooner is yeah. better than later, yeah. but you want to go, you know, donate now, support us later, whatever. It's cool. You can do this anytime you want, except maybe if you're living in the Norwegian town of Summeray, the island. Oh, heard about this town? No. I mean, uh, uh, you know, anytime I hear the word Norway, my, my ears perk up because my fondest memories were the year and a half I lived there. That's right. Brian's from there in a way. I mean, I actually, literally, my, when we got my, my genetic profile, I'm, I'm, I'm about a, like a quarter, nor uh, I don't know, Scandinavian. Me too, man. Hey, right on. Brian, is that you? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my oh. brother! <laughs> Uh, there's a town that wants to abolish time in Norway. <gasps> They're above yeah. the Arctic Circle, so like they get a period of like I don't know when like the sun don't set and stuff. And you know yeah, they you get like the law nine them, months them, without a sunset. If I if I remember that right, nine months without a sunset. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Hold on. Give one second. Just give me a moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Two branches. My brain is split in two. Oh no, I can tell, Brian. You are you are there's there's a roiling turmoil within you because like on one hand, there is a a, a, a deep excitement for a world without time, but then almost immediately you now are thinking of all the reservations that you would have. So 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 talk it out. Yeah, okay. So on the positive side, uh yeah, where the sun is shining all the time or it's night all the time, it doesn't make a lot of sense to tell you. and uh, keep in mind, times that I hate time is when I've just pulled a 18-hour all-night shift. It's 7 in the morning. I'm catching a flight and would love to at the end of an 18-hour workday have a, an adult beverage, but guess what? Old time sticking its thumb in my eye, telling me that I'm the weirdo for trying to order a gin and tonic at seven in the morning. Uh, look, yeah. you're the one with the problem, not me. So yes, 100% abolish time. Uh, uh, mow your lawn whenever you want. Hell's yeah, man, it's a free country, I, I assume. Uh, but on the flip side, it makes me think about the reason we have time to begin with. Time as we know it, really didn't exist until there were train schedules to keep. There were no time zones before the uh, train stations because there was no need to synchronize one area from the other. Every town had their own local noon. And as a result, I don't know what that means in terms of, in terms of appointment keeping or whatever. But I mean, I kind of dig the the punk rock uh, anarchist vibe of this uh, justin uh, where are you at let me all right look i don't want to be the old school marm here just taking the flights of fancy and uh, uh, uh deconstructing them but brian let me put you in a situation let's say you're on one of those 18 hour days except this time you finally make it back to your home uh, you've talked uh, on the internet a bunch about how sometimes hard it is to get to sleep, right? Some of us are quicker sleepers than other uh, others, and I know from our friendship that every every wink of sleep that you get personally is precious. So let's say you are laying your head down, you are drifting off to sleep, and 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 you are just now entering the first dream of the night when all of a sudden. <laughs> Your neighbor wants to cut his lawn. It's four o'clock in the morning. And now you're like woken up because he has freedom and you do not. There is a benefit 
for us synchronizing when certain things are appropriate to do. Uh, I, I, I feel like we are we are throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. I don't know that you could have picked a worst example because what you described is my life right now today. As they build an apartment complex a <laughs> scant 200 yards from my house, and you will never believe, Justin, what time those pneumatic drills start running. That's right, friends. Four in the GD morning is oh when God. the place lights up like they found the monolith on the moon and the and the and the beeping and the, the driving around and the flashing begins. Uh it's already your living nightmare is my current reality. So I'm gonna say can't get much worse than this. Okay. But yes, it could go on forever. <laughs> that would be the only thing that it got worse. Look, man, I'm I'm gonna you know what? Spend a few thousand dollars on a on a isolation tank. Hey, I'll be I'll be fine if I if I get to call my own shots on my schedule. That'd be that'd be okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess I guess we would probably just evolve out of it. We would we would just like be more into a world where, uh, in fact, there are some headphones that I ordered from Kickstarter, like. Uh, it was a solid, like, it was years before I left the Go Game when I was traveling all the time, but they were something that I really want, which are soft noise canceling headphones. So they are like the good, like, noise canceling things, but they were cloth and, and soft. So when you're sleeping on a plane, uh, you don't have that, like, you know, a big plastic yeah. thing kind of hitting the plastic side or whatever. Uh, but I guess we would just have those. Those would just take off the idea that uh, you are just putting yourself into a a coma or whatever. Yeah, you know, I uh not, nowadays my latest sleeping jam is uh to put in earplugs and then put in over the ear noise canceling headphones, which is almost enough for me to then wrap my tape, my face with tape like a mentalist. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, well, and and what happens is is that's Silver dollars over my eye. <laughs> that's quiet enough that I that I don't hear you know, shuffling and dogs and the the tree occasionally tapping against the window or whatever. And Have then, you tried like real earplugs? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Are real earplugs? Uh, I mean, not earbuds. I mean, no. I, I oh, said, oh, did I say earbuds? I, I, I meant earplugs. The, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Like like earplugs and then noise canceling headphones over it. And then uh, sometimes I could still barely hear something on the other side of the house or whatever, in which case maybe just a little bit of white noise, just a little bit of white noise until until I'm at that point where I drift off and I wake up just long enough to realize it would be more comfortable if this was not on my head. And then off it goes and I'm, and, and I'm able to sleep for a bit. Andrew, what would you, what, 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 do, what do you say to the abolishment of time? I'm, I'm just wondering how far away is Brian from asking for Michael Jackson's former doctor's number? <laughs> uh, not going to lie. There was like a part of me that deeply understood the uh, the one. Uh, although there there's different types of sleep and anesthetic sleep is bad sleep because you don't dream and you don't enter REM or any of that. It's not it's not restful in the way. Uh, Sometimes real sleep. not dreaming is a benefit, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, probably if you're that guy. Uh so, listen, I, I'm i a guy that lives – I have one day a week I use an alarm clock unless I have an appointment with a doctor or, you know, something, an early phone call. Guess what day of the week that I set my alarm? Uh, today. Monday. Today. Yeah! Today. Monday, Monday is alarm clock day for me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so this is what I do. I go to bed when I want to. I wake up when I want to, right? I mean, like, people – like, I – I have engineered my life to have this now. I I cohabitate now, and so I have somebody else with their own sort of, you know, schedule who's probably a much more responsible person than I am, which means that, you know, now I might, like, wake up at, like, 9 a.m. or something or 8 a.m. or 7 a.m. because of an alarm, and then I'll go back to sleep, and I've adjusted. I, I'm always – I'm an intermittent – I sleep deep. I, I'm a, I mean, I'm, I'm a light sleeper, but I always sleep pretty well, but I'm an intermittent sleeper. You know, I'll sleep for three hours, I'll get up, I'll do something, I'll go back to sleep, sleep another four hours, and then be fine. Um, so I, I live as timeless as you can, in a sense, but, you know, it's great to get rid of time until two people have to meet up and do something. Yeah. Oh, no, totally. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there is probably a collected 
a, a full 24 hours of uh, Andrew annoyed waiting for me because I said I was going to be over at his house 30 minutes before I actually showed up, that uh, I would have preferred a world without time so I wouldn't just be the a-hole showing up late. <laughs> uh, there's a thing when you read through the article about this, they talk about, like, they say, like, well, it would be great if stores would be open, school, and they were like, stores would be open and these other things whenever they want. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's called America. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> some of this just seems to be more about like being a European country. Like, well, imagine if a store could be open whenever it wanted to, and you got people working there. Like, yeah, we do that. Yeah, um, dude, Walmart get yeah. something. Uh, but I, I, I certainly th- see the appeal though when you're, you know, when you're scheduled, when you're living in a part of the world where like, yeah, the sun doesn't go down for months at a time, and it's like, well, it's four a.m. What am I going to do? You know, do I do we feel like we should stick to the schedule and be in our homes pretending it's dark out? I'll tell you what else. So there, there would be kind of a. This makes a lot of sense as like a novel touristy thing. Imagine, imagine you're going to carve out two weeks to just sort of be adrift and be without time. Now, uh, your experience as a tourist is you go. And you go as long as you want. And maybe maybe you even install an app that pays attention to when you're awake and when you're asleep. Uh, they, they've done, uh, scientists have done multiple sleep studies where people are, are robbed of all the cues of day and night. All the, and their circadian rhythms get all confused. And they notice that, that the natural sleep day is much faster than 24 hours for most people. Um, and the perception of time changes. It feels like a very, very long time when you have all those cues taken out. So I can understand as a tourist... Just saying, like, I won't even know. It'll feel like a lifetime, but it'll turn out to be two weeks. I'm just going to go and, and live my whatever, and then my app will tell me, hey, you have a flight uh, in 24 hours. Um, and then meanwhile, there would be a bit of a, I guess, a democratizing effect on local businesses because anytime one – right now, all the businesses sort of try to be open for the same 10- to 12-hour block – to try to compete against each other for the same block of, of, of consumers that come in. But in this case, essentially they would run shifts so that any given time there would be a place open because let's say, let's say once at any given time, all people were, uh, let's say two thirds likely to be awake and one third likely to be asleep. Then all of a sudden it makes sense to, uh, to, to set up multiple schedules that aren't, all around worshiping the the eight to five. I like the idea that you're staying at a hotel. They're like, Mr. Brushwood, Mr. Brushwood, it's time for you to leave. Your 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 five days are up, and you're like, are they? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm gotcha, sorry. Yeah. What what unit do you bill by? <laughs> and they're, yeah. they're like, uh, well, we monitor you, and for every good period of sleep you have, we charge you this much money. <laughs> And Brian's like, gotcha! It was the <laughs> Free vacation! Uh, so uh, let's go to uh, uh, the non-story of the week last week, which was <laughs> democracy dies in darkness, but BS thrives in sunlight, apparently. Um, uh, Washington Post was the, the first major newspaper to have, have this story, the scare story that made the round of the internet and then a couple days later the hey that story's kind of bs made the round of the internet um i'm talking about cell phones giving teens horns oh my gosh uh man i only barely skimmed this but what a great headline uh i'm not gonna lie that's infectious headline writing the reality of it uh from what little i glanced at was that basically if you hunch over and look down a lot, you you tend to your bones tend to look it, different. I mean, uh, uh, infectious is a great way to describe it, Brian, because it also made me want to throw up. Uh, this is uh, just terrible, awful, 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 awful. The story is fine. The story is interesting. Uh, uh, this- I mean, the Wapo one. It, Let me. It it says things I, weren't in there. Okay, well, I did not read the WAP, the, the Washington Post story. The, the 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 story that I when we covered it on on Daily Tech News Show was uh, uh, covering the initial study in Australia or New Zealand or something like that. That basically this was then again aggregated for another series on uh, some other network about like how technology is changing us. So the 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 science of this is that 
uh, there are protrusions in the in the ba- like inside your head. So horns is even a very weird thing to say that uh, 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 is caused from looking down, and it's not harmful. No one's going to die from it. It's fairly unremarkable. You probably live your entire life without knowing it. And I would go ahead and suspect that there's probably all sorts of different uh, uh, skeletal and physiological changes that have come along with various different elements of technology, up to and including. In fact, I would suspect that when we went from a predominantly walking or horse riding culture to a predominantly car and public uh, transportation culture, that there were probably some skeletal changes there as well. That being said, the headline writing in this was absolutely shameful. The idea that you would throw in the term that that caught the viral element of this was horns, which uh, uh, no explanation of the fact that this is not a radiation thing, uh, blatant pandering to uh, of, of folks who you know uh, might want to bring a religious or apocalyptic element to it, uh, and not to mention absolute it's blank and your kids might be doing it kind of a uh, scaremongering. This was awful, awful, awful. It was the hat trick. It was a bad tech story. It was a bad culture story and it was a bad science story. However, it was exactly what worried parents want to hear. They crave Absolutely. that so much that it don't matter if it's true. If it's, if it's in the orbit of, of if it's in the solar system of true, then it's and you squint hard enough from from uh, uh, Arcturus looking at it, then you know somebody somewhere wrote a very effective. I'm not going to say good or bad. A very effective headline I, to to put I, something out. I I think if you're a blogger like on HuffPo or somewhere else like this, and you're tired of like getting people scared of vaccines, um, great job, great headline. If you're writing for the Washington Post. And then next article your this journalist is going to do is going to be some political insight. Now I go like, I can't trust you. I don't trust you in your brand, which Washington Post is amazing journalism. It's, it's it's one of my, you know, for, for in-depth stuff. I love the WAPO, you know, but I go, I'm like, man, how many other things have I read there didn't pass this kind of scrutiny, but because there wasn't just this research paper, you could say like, no, this has to do with the back of the neck and the way ligaments attach to the, the skull. The, the scientists didn't use the term kids growing, you know, horns or whatever. That just made, to me, it, it, it's a brand damaging article. Uh, uh, I, I, I will not even attempt to make a counter argument to that. Um, well, I, I think you're, I think Brian, you're right. As far as getting people to click in it. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. I just say that like, you know, you know, we, we all have, you know, we all say, what are the limits on our brand and what we want to do? And I think that they did not want the attention they're getting now for like, wow, you guys are just yeah. writing click stuff. Well, here, uh, Bryce, can you go back to that, that, that screen that you had? Sure. Uh, uh, he said, uh, uh, David Sahar, the paper's first author, a chiropractor who recently completed a PhD in biomechanics on the Sunshine Coast, is quoted as saying, oh, that's up to probably... anyone's imagination, he told WAPO. Uh, you may say it looks like a bird's beak, a horn, a hook. You had three things that if you even wanted to go, if you were dead set on saying that, oh, no, this quote's the way to go. Horns is deliberately there because it is scare bait for a, 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 an element of our society that sees technology as, you know, man's final sin. <laughs> like the idea that kids are growing horns. This is I, I found this so gross journalistically just and, and to me, it's like, all right, you know, you're the sun. You want to run it. You're like uh, Andrew said, some uh, blog aggregator network. I Pravda. get it, man. Oh, uh, sorry. I, I said I said a uh, uh, Pravda for a, you know one of our oh, favorite yeah, sources. Pravda. Yeah, absolutely. Then I get it. But it's like for for that to have made the rounds on the level that it did with horns in the head. kids are growing horns was irresponsible. Absolutely irresponsible. Especially in an age where it's not even up for debate that uh, the vast majority of the way people consume news is just by reading the headline and never reading the article and certainly not reading the God original knows that's sources. how I do it. <laughs> um, yeah. Because yeah. if even just, if it, like, it's just a bad descriptor because the way that we think of horns are protruding like out of the head. Like that's when you think of horns, that's what you think of, not. Like, 
a, a, an element of the skull that you're never going to see and you can't feel. You know, and, and, and then there's it is concerning discerning confused. You have one group trying to manipulate everybody else by using scare tactics, you know. And for example, there was an article that came out like, oh, this these new artificial meats, they're just as bad as regular meat. And you read the article, it's like, no, they're actually saying that from what I read was they may not be any different than any other artificial meats, not comparing it to actual meat, because I'm like, I don't know who's been able to do a longitudinal study to compare, you know, heavy consumption of artificial meats versus large consumption of red meat. Nobody's been able to do that yet. But as far as and then it was you read deeper and you realize this was an anti GMO group that was putting this out there. Yeah, because they were very critical of it having GM, you know, genetically modified organisms and, and the, the GMO in it. And you're like, oh, that's what this is. This is a GMO group that's trying to, you know, you know, and I saw this picked up by blogs and stuff that would normally be pro GMO. But because they there may be anti artificial meat stuff, we'll be like, oh, look, this artificial meat, you know, it's bogus. And it's like, well, you just advocated people who you might disagree with because you didn't read further into it. All right, Justin, would you feel better, like it would be more intellectually honest if they said essentially the same headline, again, yeah. focusing on the horns, but they just phrased it yeah. as study says cell phone use making teens horny. Would, would, that, would that work better for you? I would be a I no joke. I would be a hundred percent more in favor of that headline. And if you could do maybe a series of images of uh, a, one of the Fortnite dances, uh, uh, you know, just in the headline itself, I would also greatly appreciate it. If you're somebody doing the floss, uh, like, at least it would be stupid, and you would know that it's stupid. I, I I think we would be living in a better society if it was that and not deliberately trying to scare people into thinking that this is our our, our man's downfall finally well, yeah, playing upon people's fears of this electronic device that's transmitting emf and which is kind of what many people that was the connection many people made is like oh it's the radiation it's doing this and it's like nothing's further from that but you know it's you know, I, I must admit, it, when I first read that headline, I was like, oh, here we go again. It's it's going to be some kind of crazy X-ray of a cell phone shaped uh, tumor. But also the other thing that, that that blew me away with this is that it goes to cell phones, which I guess is mentioned in the initial study. But it's like we've been looking down for a long time. Like This is like books also would lead people to typewriters. Look down. Typewriters would lead people to look down like I, I, if this is such a rapid physiological thing like i mean i guess are we looking down more i mean i mean and you're really going to track that back to 2007 we're, we're 12 years in and and there's and, and there's this measurable change uh i don't know it, it, there was there was a lot of that that really 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 frustrated me and and i'm glad that we're talking about it so we can yell at it <laughs> um one more story sure yeah, you uh, you've been following sort of the the uptick in UFO stories coming out of uh, military pilots, etc. No, there there has been. I've noticed more of it that there was some uh, uh there there was there was a, a stories I saw circulating about military folks using the term UFO and then the clarification of like literally we mean UFO the way that it's supposed to be, which is an unidentified flying object, not aliens. Yeah, so there's been, and I've read some more accounts and even some more kind of uh, military blogs and stuff that aren't prone towards these many flights of fancy. And some people saying like, "Listen, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to give you an account from you know so and so who's you know a credible person, whatever. So just read his." And and there's some really interesting stories about you know pilots out there being told, you know, "Hey, we need you to go," you know, you know, ships getting let's say anomalies. Uh, you know, seeing anomalies and being like, hey, we're not sure what this is, sending pilots out there and pilots picking up radar anomalies. In one case, you know, or a couple cases, like pilots actually seeing, seeing things in the water that like appear like surfacing, bubbling out of the water, then floating up into the air and behaving strangely. Um, so uh, I read a really cool account of one of this on, uh, God, it was a blog. What's this called? Um, a uh, fighter sweep had one and, and basically details into getting into some of the stories about this. And, uh, you know, I read this and I'm reading through like, this is, you know, fascinating. 
and you know i'm kind of i'm like i don't you know one of these things where like you know we're could be everything from some simple explanation to aliens. I don't know. I, I tend towards the simple one. And I read a very good explanation for saying, looking at some of these descriptions of like, hey, so people saw pilots were responding over an area. They saw something under the water or whatever. They saw some object appear to surface or hover and then fly up into the air, behave oddly. And um, this is from, let me find the source here. Uh, this was... The drive said, hey, you know, one of the things that's been used by submarines and naval technology for a while is using launching balloons from submarines. And some of these balloons have very exotic shapes. And, you know, if you look at some of these reports, they sound a lot like what could be something launched from, you know, a submarine where it's basically, you know, a balloon that reaches the surface, then inflates, floats for a while and then starts to reach a higher altitude and be used to provide data, et cetera. And they show some actually patent filings going back like 40, 50 years ago, and then research over time and how this has evolved into you know more sophisticated stuff. And so it could be a case of one hand not knowing what the other one's doing or some other military power, which is using something that you wouldn't normally think of you know, somebody launching balloons from underwater. or But the, some of the shapes of them have very interesting shapes because of the radar cross-sections, et cetera. Yeah, and so. we certainly uh, – there's a long history of this. During Project Blue Book, there was a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, 50 years later or 40 years later was declassified as, like, uh, yeah, over at Area 51. They did a bunch of weird-ass stuff, like taking a bunch of mannequins and throwing them out of, mm -hmm. you know, out of <laughs> planes just to see what happens. Um, yeah, it's weird because – on the one hand, uh, nowadays that cameras are so ubiquitous, I kind of don't have any patience for stories full stop nowadays. It's like, if you don't have video, then don't talk to me. But even worse is we've, we're have we entering a golden age of deep fakes and simulated video. So even if you do have video, maybe don't talk to me. I, I don't know really yeah. where, where I'm at now. And and uh, it's, it's interesting that the very tools that enabled this sort of, you know, mid 90s to early 2000s golden age of truth are the exact same tools that allow for this impressive bubbling and siloing of information that that has has us all suspicious of everyone. Yeah, my you know, my frustration and I remember back in the 90s and stuff when I was, you know, kind of full time working with the JRF investigating this stuff was often that on one hand is you don't want to be the skeptic that dismisses everything and says, yeah, BS, yeah, it's not true, because that's not a scientific attitude. But the thing that was frustrating was on the other side was, you know, I would talk to people who believed in UFOs and I'd bring up, you know, other, you know, regarding other things like, well, this looked like it was flares or like, oh, it's disinformation, it's disinformation. It's like, in, in their course, I mean, their point of view, there was nothing that would convince them it wasn't aliens. And it's like, yeah. well, that's not... That doesn't sound like, I mean, I'm, that's not that's a, reasonable like a reasonable position. Point. Exactly. You know, so like, I mean, I, I look at like, yeah, probably balloons. Like, I think I'm less likely to believe in oh, intergalactic visitors or stuff like this. But hey, somebody's pointing the simulation. I don't know. But it was a great example, though, because I remember reading the original account going like, yeah, I don't know what's going on here. I'm not smart enough. To, I'm not a naval expert, or aviation expert to know. And then I read this other article. I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes that makes sense, you know. I got sent a video the, this morning from a, a reader of the Free Political Newsletter who was talking about how his cousin is very into a conspiracy that I had not heard of, but uh, it is that the moon is an alien space station uh, <laughs> and was placed. That's no moon. It, it literally, that was the number one comment on the YouTube video, which, by the way, was so well produced and was uh, 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 came along with an advertisement for a subscription service for other uh, uh, for for other conspiracy uh, videos, which made me wonder, like, oh my god, there's a lot of this. A lot of this is out here, and they're putting money into making these document these little mini explainer videos look really, really good. Which this one did. It looked better than. A lot of explainer videos for other uh, uh, topics that I really care about, which means that there's probably more money going into it. Yeah, you get, you know, you get people who get into this and sort of maybe have a middle school level of science on stuff, and they read something that sounds very, very credible, 
And then they just take a deep dive into that direction and they don't back up to say, well, let me go look at the alternative point of view. And they get like the flat earthers and stuff. They're like, ah, I look across the bay and it's curved and yet I see the city. How is this possible? And it's like, well, you're only seeing the upper half of the buildings, <laughs> you know, but, but you know, it's, it's little detail, but you know, and that's the problem is, is that in we as people who we accept arguments from authority and I've watched people try to debunk stuff, you know, using, you know, bad information, which makes it worse. And I don't know. I mean, we all just need to step back and say, maybe I'm mistaken or I can be. Hey, look, it, it is, it is a deep religious commitment that I try to live my life, uh, understanding that I'm very dumb. Yeah. <laughs> if I get things right. It is by total accident. You know, Brian and I have accepted that about you too, Justin. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's just, it's like when I, so when I worked when, you know, years ago, for those who know, I used to work for the James Ray Educational Foundation. We had a million dollar prize to anybody who could prove they had psychic powers. And I would, every day I get on the phone to somebody who was absolutely convinced that they had powers or whatever. And I talked to smart people, PhDs and other people who were educated. And I mean, not just it's some smart, clever people who had crazy ideas. And I would sit there and I'd get off the phone and I'd be like, What's the dividing line between me and them? What is the separating thing? And I realized the one thing that separated me from this person, because you would talk to somebody about like, well, maybe you didn't see like, no, I know what I saw. And it's like, you're like, what's the difference between you and somebody in an insane asylum who thinks they're Napoleon? Like, well, they're crazy. And it's like, yeah, but how do we decide that? And I realized, you know what the difference was? Certainty. And that was the people who had the crazier belief had the most certainty because they thought themselves infallible. And I said, that was, I said, that's how I'll know if I'm going crazy. If all of a sudden, you know, you can, I, there are things that like, I tell you, like everything about me tells me this is to be true, but I know ultimately there is this layer of which I can be mistaken and I can never, ever, you know, get rid of that layer. And when you say, no, nope, I know this to be absolutely hundred percent true. There's no way it could be true. That's when I step back and go, you're not a rational person. That That is definitely the part, you know, in casual conversations, you talk about times that you've been scared by what you thought might be a ghost or whatever. And then, you know, stories and you start exploring. And then for me, there's usually some moment that it flips a switch and I realize this is not open for debate or serious consideration for it to be mm -hmm. anything other than what this person believes, at which point I en enter new subroutine. Oh, how interesting in which, in which I just keep saying, Oh, how interesting. And to put no energy into it and wait for the soonest off ramp to literally any other topic com of conversation, because I know there'll be no benefits, no payoffs. There's no sitting down talking about the malleability of memory. There's no sitting down and talking about standards of evidence because of across this line you will not tread yeah yeah it, that's that's unfortunately often the way you have to do it and that's once i you know, you have that like okay because they're like so there's absolutely no doubt whatever and i'm like okay so this is a religious discussion right well in which yeah. case in which case i found a bevy of amazing conversational linguistic tactics everything from oh how yeah. interesting like oh that must have felt fantastic or how strange yeah. what did that feel like oh to <laughs> i mean i would imagine looking around and being in the presence of what i thought was a ghost that must have been incredible you know i had an amazing experience i was playing final fantasy 7 and i almost <laughs> defeated the the whole game. Oh. What? Not Hearthstone? Oh, that was your <laughs> yeah, I mean, so again, that's the, we're all crazy. We all, and, and that's the thing that I think we learned in, you know, both in magic and critical thinking explorations is you start paying attention to how we personally are deceived and we make these mistakes. And that's step number one is we, we have this culture where we train ourselves to spot the flaws in other people's arguments but we don't like to spot, spot the flaws on our own. If you don't think you have any, you're not paying attention. So let's do picks. Yo, man, I got a pick. I got a pick that I lost a, a good 10, 12 hours to this week. Uh, it was fantastic. And, and I want to track down who was the first person to suggest it to me because I thought it was uh, Brant or Bryce. It was me. Uh, it, I actually it, am still convinced it was Andrew. Uh, oh, it, it might be Andrew. Andrew, was it you that recommended Defunct Land to me? Uh, I mentioned it first. I loved it. I've talked to other people's thought, but yeah, Defunct Land was was my big, wow, the internet's wonderful. 
it, experience. it is a remarkable, wonderful rabbit hole. And you start with, just look through the stuff they have. Uh, Defunct Land is all about um, theme park attractions that have closed or not around anymore. Uh, it, the easiest thing is to find them talking about something that you know or one that you went to. I watched the one on Astro World, Six Flags Astro World in Houston. Mm -hmm. I, of course, there's a bunch of uh, exhibits I remember from Disneyland, Disney World that aren't there in, anymore. Um, uh, I, I worked at a camp teaching magic when I was 19, 20 years old. Uh, and we went to Action Park, the notorious Action Park. So that 30 minute episode <laughs> about Action Park was extraordinary. And I just felt, and then at some point you trust their storytelling enough that you start learning about like, apparently there are dozens of Santa villages that are yeah. uh, that are all abandoned and decayed, and they explain the story of how they happened and how they came in twenty year cycles, and and how the upbringing of one generation determined the affection for Christmas for the next one. Uh, it's it's extraordinary. The uh, uh, and now I found that they're doing uh, another series called Defunct TV, and if you want to start with anything. Start with the four-part miniseries about Jim Henson. It, it covers his early works, it covers how he sold The Muppet Show, covers how he went into and, and, and did Fraggle Rock, and it talks about all of his other projects, including uh, The Dark Crystal, and it paints an extraordinary, I think all four of them total up just over about an hour and a half, I'd, th I'd say, but it is, it is just extraordinary storytelling extremely well produced i loved it so so much and this is all on youtube this yes is, uh, yeah correct not a streaming thing i haven't started a funk tv i've watched all of the he does them in seasons i've watched all the seasons of funk land and it's it is the, the beautiful and i said this before the beauty of the internet is there's a guy that can go out there and take a deep dive into doing documentaries that are better than most of the stuff i've been watching that are produced professionally whatever that means now um, more, more detail, more depth, and it's niche, but oh, it's they're so it, it makes me love the time that we're alive in. I'll tell you what, man, uh, <laughs> there is a theme to some of the I think the second season never overtly states that it's a scathing indictment of Michael Eisner's handling of the theme park <laughs> oh, yeah. side of things. But, but boy, oh boy, once an episode, do you get a reminder of how that dude was running the theme park side of things? If you go into some of the other ones that do sort of similar stuff like Yesterland and all that, you, 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 you become very aware of, you know, people's opinion, but he, the funk fan will give, give Eisner credit where Eisner sort of deserves it, but then we'll then point out, you know, decisions he made. Yeah, and you are left with sort of a an, an understanding of Eisner's mixed legacy, and uh, yeah. I, I think that's a fair way to put it. I mean, I, I don't yeah. want to take anything away from the genuine good he did for the company, but uh, but oh, amazingly, how much he rebuilt Disney, built it into a financial giant that it was. You know, on, on the as far as like how the park side and some of the creative side and where it could have gone. You know, there's there's some frustrations there, but yeah, he he may have saved Disney and kept it from getting acquired. He was the one that did California Adventure, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, uh, he's like, you know what people want when they go to Disneyland in California? Why let, why go to the rest of California? We'll build it into a park here, you know? It's like, yeah. wait, is that a, were they losing uh, uh, possible visitors to Napa Valley? I, I <laughs> think, I think LA? that is one of the first episodes I watched was the story of what, Limousine Chase or something that, the, oh, yeah. The yeah. worst. <laughs> hands down the worst Disney ride of all time. And he explains how originally it was going to be like the rock and roller coaster. You had to escape from the paparazzi and then princess Diana died. And oh then they realized God. they couldn't do that. And so they said, how about we make it very, very slow. And we just have a bunch of bad gags, but we only do the gags from, you know, ABC stars because that's who we own and can get the likenesses to. Uh, it's, it's, Extraordinary. Watch as many of those as, as yeah, you can. We don't want to spend the money, so we're going to build it in a warehouse building, and we don't really want to build animatronics, so we're going to take a bunch of painted plywood. And oh. uh, uh, the, the creepiest part was when they gave that ride a facelift. Uh, I forgot what the new theme was. I think it was a Monsters, Inc. thing. Uh, they had all of these caricatures of famous Hollywood people, but and so they just put them inside radiation suits <laughs> to be workers in the Monsters, oh. Inc. factory. So, like, inside, and you could tell from the posture that it's like, 
That is a Drew Carey caricature Drew Carey, yep. wrapped up in a biohazard <laughs> suit pretending to lift uranium or something. Oh, he's <laughs> great about that. Like there was a robot in Star Tours that like this this robot working on another robot. And it was one of the goose from like Country Bear Jam or something or from like the uh, Splash Mountain or something like this. They literally took this goose and just put it over there, stripped it off of all of the fur. Oh, and my God. And it just looked like a horrific robot. Oh, that's yeah, amazing. Perfect. Done. Super, superstar Three. limo. That's the name of it. Oh yeah. my god, it's it's great. All of these are so so good. Next. Uh, well, hey, uh, speaking of uh, 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 documentaries that aren't documentaries, Andrew Main sent me a text message on Sunday uh, because we have had a fascination with the uh, the series documentary. Now, uh, I think we were both in agreement that ep- uh, season two was was not quite. Uh, 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 to the level of season one and so I had not seen season three despite it being on Netflix uh, Andrew gave me the, uh, the, the 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 thumbs up and so I dove into it and it is awesome I, I think that there's there's really not a dud uh, it, in there the, the only real big departure between the two is that previously the uh, previous two seasons it had been kind of a gigantic character uh you know, a showcase for Bill Hader and Fred Armisen, who were in almost every single episode. This one, uh, Fred Armisen is in the majority of them, but not all of them. Uh, but it it certainly covers up the star power with a bunch of other awesome guest stars. Uh, really, really good stuff. If, if you like the previous two, this one features uh, parodies of the uh, uh, Finding Mr. Watterson uh, the the Calvin and Hobbes, the guy who went out looking for the Calvin and Hobbes author. This one, it's finding Mr. Larson. So he's trying to find Gary Larson <laughs> from the part. But it's awesome. Like it, it 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 is at its best. Documentary now is always great at showcasing something beyond the gags. Like it's not just a like wackety schmackety portrayal of serious subject matter. They often kind of can take these real emotions and hopefully it's uh, you know they they land it in a funny place. And there's a lot of that. Uh, 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 Fred Armisen is great. There's an awesome uh, uh, recording of, uh, or a documentary of the recording of what is obviously a Rent kind of parody. Uh, uh, it's a co-op, the musical, but it's got uh, great stuff. Uh, with John Mulaney and James Urbaniak, uh, Taron Killam. It's uh, very, very funny. You know who wrote that? Uh, the the co-op? Yeah. One, was it Mulaney? Mulaney and Seth Myers. Yeah. And Seth Myers has written like half of these, you know, between doing a TV gig and doing this, the writing's great. Like you look behind you, like what's part of neat. What's cool about this is you look who's been working on this stuff. And like the bowling one, Tim Robinson's in it and he co-wrote and you just got like Bill Hader co-wrote some of them. Like you just a really amazing, you know, collection of talent, both on camera and writing these things. Oh yeah, Brian. If if uh, you know, we were we are big fans of. Uh, I think you should leave. Uh, Tim Robinson is uh, plays opposite the uh, dude what played Dexter Mark in T. Hall. A, yeah, in a in a documentary about professional bowling, uh, that is awesome. But but Tim Robinson is the the like '90s era bad boy of uh, a profession professional bowling, which uh, there was a there was a dude who he's he's mimicking that used to do the uh the like suck it chant or the the <laughs> suck it like crotch chop Pete uh, Weber. Yeah, Pete Weber. So it's it's great, but it's also it just plays right into that perfect zone that Tim Robinson kind of exists in of just like arrogance and awkwardness uh yeah. that is is certainly brought to life in the world of professional bowling. Oh, that's I'm amazing. not going to lie with that hair piece he had on there. I'm like you could be a leading man. You, know? <laughs> you watch, you know, I think you should leave. You're like not a leading man. You know, it's like, you know, very interesting. Bryce. Uh, yeah, I got a pick. So last week uh, we reported on this on, on court killers when, when it was announced, but it finally came out. Uh, Netflix got the streaming rights. The first, the first any time ever anyone's gotten digital rights to uh, neon Genesis seven galleon. Uh, a classic uh, uh, mid '90s uh, mech anime. Uh, it's it's about a 14 year old boy who is called to 
uh, the new Neo Tokyo 3 uh, by his father to, to control these giant mechs to save the world from uh, angels, which are these monsters that are coming uh, to attack the planet. And it's really, it, it's got a lot of depth and maturity. Like, it, it, even if it's a mech show about teenagers, it's definitely, like, a very mature um, story. But it's uh, it, it's great. It, it really sort of deconstructs the idea of, like, oh, yeah, we'll just take some teenagers and make them save the world. And it really kind of examines a lot of that stuff of, like, the realities of killing um and and it gets into some weird psychological stuff. Um, uh, you know, the the creator uh, said that he wrote it about his depression and and uh, as a teenager, and you really sort of see a lot of that um, come through here. It's 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 really good, and I think they also got some of the films that they did after the series was done. So uh, you have like twenty six episodes, and then these two movies that kind of supplement the ending. Um, I think it's great. I never watched it. I have no dog in the fight about all the stuff about these very little changes that they made to, to the script or to the uh, to the dub. But I think it's very cool, and now it's on Netflix, so people can see it uh, anywhere. So Neon Genesis Evangelion. Cool. I I have a a pick, and um, you ever see something somebody do something, and you go, man, I wish something I wanted to do, but man. They did such a great job and better than I would have done with so much more attention and love that I'm kind of angry at them, but I'm really impressed. And well, welcome to the bulk of my career as a touring magician. There's a reason I couldn't bring myself to watch most magic acts because it was either going to be better than I ever could or 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 make me not even interested in trying. Yeah, so I I had seen. On YouTube, I'd seen some of these view clips by this person. I saw the headlines for it. And I'm like, ah, every time I see something like this on some really cool science fiction or you know far out there sci-fi topic or futuristic topic, they get it wrong. They just get it wrong. They don't understand. They don't know. They don't really they didn't do the research. And I'm not going to click on this because I just don't want to sit there and you know have to be like, oh, you got it all wrong. And then one day I'm like, I'm going to click on this article about like alien mega structures or whatever and you know just laugh at how wrong they got it but they didn't they 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 got it right they made points i'd never even thought of they did their physics they did their research they did a deep dive and i start clicking into things about like you know you know fast forms of you know uh uh like you know you know you know space travel other stuff all these sorts of things and really far off crazy like post singularity physics and topics about economies and all this stuff. And I've only seen maybe half a dozen of them. They're all amazing. They're all amazing. And it's like, and it's, I'm like, I love YouTube because some nerd who's nerdier than me and smarter than me has made these incredible documentaries that just, you know, that on topics with graphics and stuff that are and fantastic. And this is science and futurism with Isaac Arthur. Um, and, at first, I had to get into it because I will tell you this just, you know, his speech is a bit affected. I don't know why, but a few minutes in, you get past that and you get into the knowledge. And that's wonderful about YouTube is that here is somebody in his own voice telling you amazing stuff that would not maybe have had a chance on a traditional outlets, which would have been our loss. And now it's our gain because this guy's done wonderful stuff. He has a thing on colonizing Pluto and what it would take and all these really cool, if you're into space and thinking about way the hell out farther out, he does such a wonderful job of, you know, talking about this stuff. His physics is great. His biology is great. He's really, really got a science down. So, um, you know, he talks about, you know, what's it going to be like if we could have, you know, this this super big economy and, you know, expand outwards into the solar system, the universe and and grounded in real physics and stuff. So Isaac Arthur Science and Futures from Isaac Arthur. I've again I've only had a chance to watch it about a half dozen or so. They're wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So, awesome. They yeah. make me angry. Just, <laughs> it just makes me angry. So um cool. Gentlemen, it's been petty. <laughs> and weird. <laughs> there we go. Hey, that's a show. That's a show. Hello. That's a spicy meatball show. Uh, anybody need a break? 
Uh, yeah, uh, I believe I heard my daughter returning after two days uh, out with her uh, grandparents. So let me make sure if all is well. All right, I'll give you one moment. Sure. Cool. I'm going to stay here because I went to the bathroom during the show. <laughs> How's it going, Justin? Oh, man, you want to know what? I'm drinking a lot of water again. That's good. That's good for you. It is, but it means I pee all the time again. That's also good for you. Is it? I, I don't so. know. There's a lot of there's a controversy brewing on R slash hydro homies. Wait, serious? Yeah, this is partly the reason why I'm drinking a lot of water again because I fell into the subreddit R slash hydro homies. I'm gonna this is not gonna be like piss porn, right? I'm gonna It's not piss porn. It's literally just a subreddit dedicated to people making memes about drinking a lot of water. Okay. Uh, uh yeah, but the, there, there, there seems to be a there seems to be a controversy H2OG. on whether or not <laughs> uh, whether or not peeing clear is good or bad for you. It's good. It's a sign that you had enough water. Well, yeah, but then if you do it a lot, some people are like, "Oh no, it's your body telling you that you shouldn't be drinking that much water." No, it's <laughs> what. Look, I don't care. I'm riding into the danger zone. Sure. Uh, I also back. realize that I've, I've drank way more than I should. Um, you know, or no, more than the recommended amount. I guess it's like eight cups of water, right, mm -hmm. a day. And I'm pretty much doing that like before 10 a.m. I'm drinking like uh, uh, four pints of water. Uh, before like ten. Before ten, okay. I mean, and I, that pretty much whenever I pee, I'll go chug another pint of water. But, but that's good. You need water, especially when you wake up, because you've been been fasting while you were sleeping. I will say this. Yeah, uh, I have found that uh, uh, chugging two pints of water before I have coffee uh, mm -hmm. is is good for me. I feel a lot better. It starts my day off a lot more right. Yeah. Real water drinkers know that all water doesn't taste the same. Well, yeah, yeah. of course it doesn't. <laughs> this is <yeah>, okay. <laughs> it's a weird subreddit, man. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> These people are into water, man. I love it, man. I <laughs> love water so much. Have you seen um, the... Uh, r slash outside no it's basically the idea that the world is just another video game uh-huh and oh, it's pretty yeah. funny because you know like just to take a look at some of the headlines yeah. on r outside yeah they're like oh yeah it's uh, nobody patched the social anxiety thing if a tree falls in a woods does it, and there's nobody around does it make a sound of course not it wouldn't render in the first place uh, one of the top ones is what is the best go back up what is the uh, what is the best strategy in the current meta Let's see. <laughs> like uh, yeah. like you know Bailey you know like what's the best way to you oh. know in earn in-game currency and all that <laughs> <laughs> yeah I love all these little like I don't know uh, uh, not gimmicky but just you know purpose subreddits yeah. You know, one of the things I think that uh, I didn't put the story in this week, which was kind of like, hey, do these brain activity games work? And the research seems to say, yeah, probably not. Like, you might learn a special skill, but not. But we know our brains are adapting and changing. And one of the things I think that's adapted is our ability to kind of get the joke faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like you look at a, you know, what's this? One frame, one sentence or two, and you go, oh, got it. Now I'm in the joke with everybody else, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is, um, I don't know, the meme. I'm just glad that, what, I mean, yeah, the first time I ever heard the word meme was Andrew recommending the site Meme Pool. <laughs> meme pool remember that meme pool yeah meme pool was uh good times oh so you the... you heard meme first as a joke and but and then second as the way dawkins had originally proposed it 
No, no, no. I think it was memepool.com was like a like a, a proto, uh, you know, or a contemporary of Slashdot, but proto dig or or Reddit or whatever. It was just like a a place where it was like a blog. It was like yeah, like one of those half blog, half a bunch of contributors are just putting up a bunch of stuff. Uh, but meme was, uh, I, I think it was referenced as as a as a, a the. By the Dawkins definition in the explainer for what that was was like well, just you're coming to the meme pool where like all these shared ideas are percolating and growing but it was almost like like the primordial ooze of the internet and then meme I guess eventually uh, became the like this is the, the crystallization these are the 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 jokes or or things that are evoking a reaction that you can see and get immediately yeah, for, for me, it was Dennett's book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, and then, like, uh, Dawkins doing River Out of Eden, which followed up, like, as I don't think I read, like, <clears throat> we went a selfish we're watchmaker, back, right? like, in 78 or whatever when he first described it, but it, it kind of sat in obscurity for a while. Yeah, and I then... remember it was uh, late 90s that I read, um, or maybe early, even 2000s, that I read an art Wired article by Dawkins in which he explained mm. the idea. Uh, so it's it's weird to have a 15 year old who was born after I read that article explain to me how I don't know what memes are, <laughs> you know, because, yeah. because I'm referring to it in its in its uh, original, you know, from the person who invented the term. <laughs> yeah, it was like I think he said it like was like in '78. It was in the first time he used it because the idea of, um, hey, uh, <laughs> we and to... it was one of those ideas like one of his brilliant ones that somebody on that case did it. I think Susan Blackmore too. You know, ran with it. Um, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. I, I am having a technical hiccup here, so I might have to hang up and call you right now. Okay. Computer is uh, not very happy with me right now. I don't really know why. How was your weekend, Brian? It was good. Uh, we, uh, man, had a long shoot day on Saturday. We did. Uh, then Sunday was a media consumption powerhouse day. Went and watched a, a Toy Story 4, got caught up on Chernobyl, uh, watched uh, extras. Uh, I, th I think I watched some stuff just for fun. Uh, it was probably a little bit more defunct land. Oh, yeah? Uh, did you catch up on uh, Chernobyl? Episode uh, 2? Yeah. Uh, man, episode episode two is so much better than episode one. Like I still like that episode a one. Lot. I, I'm still not the... the uh, I, I, I like episode one. Like, I understand... Well, all the things I wanted from episode one, I got in episode two. Uh, specifically, a grounded context of just how bad the disaster is, you know? Yeah. But I don't see any way for them to have given me that in the first episode. Uh, so I understand why everything went the way it was. Uh, thank you for your patience, everybody. I'm saving this file because I need to restart this computer because it is being very unresponsive. So we'll be able to keep the stream up and you can hear us. This will just take an extra couple minutes. <laughs> Open Bayou wants to know if I'm happy that Amtrak is going to lose the movie draft. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I really wonder how much money they'll get out of rerunning a re- Putting, putting Avengers back in the theater. I mean, even if it's, quote-unquote, only $100 million, which it easily could be. I, I think it's... That, but, that, but that's what I'm saying. Is that, that, you, that seems like a lot. We, we will talk about this on Cord Killers, but it is a real indication that movies are down all around that, by all rights, Endgame should have blown the hell past Avatar. Yeah. There's nothing... Like, that is a serious indication of how ill this market is that that end game somehow didn't just instantly blow blow up avatar yeah uh there was a there was a, a i think it was an opinion piece on the hollywood reporter or um uh deadline or one of those articles or one of those sites those hollywood sites um that was like yeah uh this is fatigue this is franchise fatigue like viewers are very are ready for a new thing um and uh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, got to restart it. Hopefully, this will fix it. Um, but yeah, people are, are fatigued with franchises and sequels. I mean, Men in Black. I mean, Toy Story, with with its great uh, uh, reviews and all, 
I think it's still probably going to come in under what it should do for how good that movie is. Yeah, I, I no longer think it's going to hit 300 million in the time frame allotted to it, yeah. which is remarkable, especially considered how considering how good it is. Yeah. I was going to try to sneak that in sometime this weekend, but I can't, uh, I can't make well, it. Uh, you know what? Uh, the family was going to go see it. Um, I think once we wrap up, I I went yesterday with Penny because I knew I had to see it, mm -hmm. uh, much to Joshi, Josie's chagrin. Uh, but uh, we, I think the family was going to go see it after spoiler in time. So if you want to join us. I got to get home after spoiler okay. in time because it's a long night. But um, I, might tr I might try to sneak in a daytime showing tomorrow. Worth it. It's, uh, you know. The question on everybody's mind is, well, what stories are there left to tell? And they find a very good story to tell. Oh, very good. Glad to hear it. All right. We are restarted. Are and and specifically one second. that doesn't undercut the power of the end of the third movie. Oh, good. Because, yeah. Not, or not substantially. I mean. And I think they position the very end of that movie to open new ideas and stories. So, um, uh, three, I mean, specifically. Uh Okay, we're back. The video is back. Join the call. We're back, baby. Can they hear us? We Can got they him. See us. Got yes. him. Yes. <laughs> Everything broke, but we fixed it. Good job, everybody. Just an, another extra minute or so while I. You're literally blurry. How does that happen? We're blurry. Yeah. I also can't uh, switch to you as my default. Let me see. It might be because. Why are we blurry? Oh, is our. Unblur What's my background. Skype there thing? we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it just shows all of us as background? Uh, yeah. Oh, shoot. You know what? I didn't get NDI turned on. One sec. Boop, boop. Weird. This is the first time NDI in a while didn't just automatically turn on. Oh, you're spinning oh, I'm, something. Uh, yeah, I'm spinning. <laughs> uh, it does sound like a weird, like, uh, I don't know, mating call of a locust or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Settings, Man, we got this. Calling, advanced. There we go. Allow NDI usage. External zone. Give him a call. Join the call. Listen to this podcast. Unblur my background. There we go. I think we did it. I think we did it. All right. Can you hear us? I yeah. can hear you. Okay. Can you see us? Um, I cannot bring up your your uh, thing. So hold on. Let me let me exit out and come back. I, I have the same problem. Okay. It's the Shirani track. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to run. Yeah. Did you have a good weekend, Andrew? There we go. All right. We're all good. Yep. Now we good. Oh, sorry, it's allergies hitting me. Um, so uh, uh, here was the thought that I had. I was listening to this podcast about the transformation of the NBA, uh, which has like really seen this gigantic explosion of popularity uh, because all of their micro transactions have become that much bigger. Like the the free agency has become just as big and now all of a sudden they're expanding the things that used to be part of their year round uh, schedule that nobody would care about like summer league which is when all the like newly drafted players and people who are coming into the league that probably won't even make a team now like this year for the first time not only does it have a big television presence but also it's now become this like vacation destination thing because it happens in Vegas uh, and, and it's it's now sort of exploded so I was like what other industries have and could further benefit from every little micro transaction being covered more obsessively? And one of the things I thought of was like, you know what's fascinating that I always love, the stories that I think we all always love hearing from friends of ours that work in television and film are like, oh, you know who pitched this? Like somebody's pitching this it it went out there and the studio rejected it for X, Y, or Z reason. And nobody really talks about it all that much because you never really want to embarrass people. It's a reputation uh, business. But at the same time, 
I would love it if I could follow ideas more from kind of conception to uh, a completion. Uh, you know, if, if beyond the like, you know, we see it a lot with with the uh, you know comic book properties or adaptations or something like that. But I would love for for writers that I like, you know, to follow a lot more of that granular kind of stuff. You know, I'll give you an example though. Like, here's the uphill battle. <clears throat> I've been reading about, like, you know, the, the Game of Thrones prequel. Yeah. You know, which just started production, apparently. Yeah. You'll see a lot of headlines. So-and-so cast. So-and-so cast. I had to go through, like, five articles to find out who the F are the showrunners for it. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm, it's great that you cast these people. Those were all fine actors. That's not going to tell me if this is going to be any good or not. Exactly. Because you know? often we hear, like, oh, such and such is, you know, being made. And then you read to see who the showrunner is, and you're like... Oh, okay. Never mind. You know, because they they make things on a budget or for channels that just want something. And then the showrunners, by this, by all count, counts, seem to be should have every opportunity to be do a good job of this. But that's been so. The problem is just often it's like you know it's like I'm sort of I, I get annoyed sometimes because I'll talk about the writers, the writers, the writers about stuff. But you know, damn if that's like isn't so much a big big factor in you know what makes things work yeah so jane goldman is working george r martin she's written a lot with uh was it brian k vaughn yeah or my Ma matthew vaughn sorry matthew vaughn so she's she's uh you know she's got some you know some good bona fides and some one of the other showrunners on there uh has worked on some good stuff and then like you know you got I'm, I'm confident i think i think they they're i think they're setting themselves up for success but you know, other times you hear about stuff and you're like, oh, geez. I think that was really the 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 the, the end point that I came to was like, man, I really just kind of wish that writers that I would I was able to follow the 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 day to day of writers pitching things more and and mm -hmm. what ideas they have Which and like, where they're going with the, them and the closest you get to that right now is the vague. Circuitous talk that you know somebody on their blog is able to say like, all right, well, there's a thing. I had a meeting with a guy, and I can't say what it was, but who exactly. I feel this about. This is how I'm feeling today, and it's only retroactively after the fact they're able to piece together like, oh, I get it. He was pitching this thing that letter landed with so and so, and all that stuff. Yeah, and and the ch and it, I think it's a nursing topic because it's like the part of the problem is and we've talked about this before is like you'll see whose name is on the 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 top billion on the script but you'll see four other names attached to it yeah you know and then whoever's most famous is the one that we'll give credit for even though you know you hear like oh you know uh jj abrams toy story or something like well he was like fifth down you know or whatever you know and you hear some of these other things like people were attached to stuff and you realize like mm -hmm. We gravitate because the name we know, and we 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 apportion an amount of responsibility or the success of it upon that person's name, even though it may not be them. And Hollywood works the same way. So that's challenge number one: is like who wrote or wrote, but then like the length of time too. It's like I remember you, Brian. Did you ever watch the Sarah Connor Chronicles? Oh sure, loved it. I, I thought it was one of the most. I was I was. Super optimistic about it, and it wasn't until uh, Lena Headley ended up in uh, Game of Thrones that I decided that the universe was better off after all for that being canceled, because uh, I thought it was great. Yeah, and the 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 writer of that, I remember watching uh, Josh Friedman. I remember you know you know behind the scenes stuff on him, and you know he then you're like all of a sudden Josh Friedman vanishes us for a while, and do you know what like he went off and did? Hmm. He was part of the pool that that uh, him and uh, Ronald D. Moore were the ones George Lucas hired to go write and plan out like a hundred episodes of, of the Mandalorian Star Wars uh -huh. series. Yeah, uh -huh. wow. And that was probably his big project for a while, whatever. And you're like, well, there's an amazing talent uh, that went hey, away. Hey guys, can, uh, can we can we start the after things? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. we'll jump right into it. But meanwhile, yeah. he's going to be doing the Foundation series now. So anyhow, cool. But, yeah. All right, All right you ready? ready to go whenever you are. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Mr. Justin, is it Robert Young? <laughs> it's me. I know. Bryce Castillo. Oh, hey, that's me. Hey, you remembered my name. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, gentlemen, uh, let's talk about things that are after. And I, I want to I bring up something that 
it's been making the round of the news. I think you guys have probably talked about them on different podcasts, and it might be kind of an interesting thing to talk about on After Things, because I think it could have an effect for creative professionals. And that is uh, Facebook jumping into Libra, which I hesitate to call it a cryptocurrency because it's not totally crypto. Um, it's and it's not like you know, a, you're not like Bitcoin where it's you know you're generating from algorithms. It's it's basically a you know uh, a, a monetary unit or a token unit that's backed by real currencies, whatever. But it's one of these things that's sort of like kind of. Uh, Got a lot of talk of like, oh, like they're doing their own Bitcoin or whatever, sort of, kind of. And also like, hey, Facebook's doing it, which, you know, can be scary. Um, although I'm loving my Oculus Quest and I, I see a world in which I'm consumed by Facebook 24-7 now and against my better judgment. Libra is exciting in the sense that a, a, a currency like this has a lot of potential because... Um, somebody says it's a blockchain. A blockchain is a matter of a record. A blockchain is a way of recording the transactions that can be held by a small group of institutions, whatever. It's and a blockchain can be everything from a database to whatever. Well, the principal idea is the idea is like let's have a fungible type of unit that you could you could do micro transactions with, and that's what's exciting about it is the idea that like right now if you want to buy something for thirty cents on the internet, you really can't because credit card processing fees are 30 cents, you know, or this. And that was one of the promises or, or the allures of cryptocurrencies and all the different forms of that was you could do microtransactions, you could buy things for smaller amounts, and you could do, there's a whole world of commerce that could happen, and I think that's really what Libra's going for. Um, yeah, I don't know. It sounds to me like World of Warcraft gold. Uh, it's not really crypto. You got one entity that, that owns and controls everything. Um, is it is it um is there a marketplace to exchange both ways dollars for libra yeah no, it's backed by dollars it's like it's it's literally you put 10 million in you have 10 million of these units yeah it's not warcraft gold we're like we make as much gold as we want it's like a supposed to be literally basically a conversion utility so the idea is that you take you put money into this thing and that's what the value of it is is determined by how much money is put into it so uh, it's not it's not an arbitrary, oh, you 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 know, like Bitcoin where we have an algorithm system or, you know, Warcraft money where it's like, today we decide we're going to produce 10,000 more units. It's right. like literally, hey, I put $500 into this and that's worth $500. So the, this sounds almost closest to PayPal. Like when you pay a friend, there's no transaction fee for either party because it's PayPal's, PayPal still is holding all the money. They're just, you mm -hmm. know, assigning it to this account and not that account, right? Yeah. Yep. I would I would say that's a fair thing or basically being able to say that you can have the money spread across multiple accounts is where the blockchain kind of aspect comes into it. But the idea that knowing if money this exists, this is a real unit and we can move it from here to here, but we can get around having to do uh, basically building this on top of a platform that makes it easier to move money backwards and move it around. Uh, that so, seems like a net net. I mean, uh, having another play in the market, fine, or whatever, uh, you're right. Everything I hate about it has to do with the word Facebook, and that's it. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think about the idea of what does it mean when, you know, you can buy things for two cents or three cents? You know, what does it mean if you say, you know what, I'm going to put – and it may be a horrible idea, but I'm going to say, let's say I'm going to put a little – bank account on my browser i'm going to put two dollars in my browser and sites that accept libra whenever i go there i know that i'm supporting them and they're not going to run ads and I'll, i could just use an ad blocker but i'll tell you what you you know where this would get me is what i've wanted for a long time is a universal subscription so that i can read all journalistic articles from all different uh, uh newspapers all at once i'm tired of of seeing yep. the number one headline on google news be something behind a paywall and if it instead just said hey you're signed in on facebook uh you want you want to watch read this for three cents i'm like well hell yeah what's three cents i will hit that button all day long and not even yep. think about it that's what i'm talking about brad yeah i mean uh there's there is a tremendous future out there for those who want to take advantage of it. If if this is indeed wired into you know your browser or something like that, then hell, uh, we have already seen uh, uh, you know all three of us are an example of people who are paying for free products. 
So uh, uh, we, we have established that the internet gives us the ability to reward the people that we want to see continue make to make uh, the products and services that we like. Uh, I certainly uh, feel Brian's frustration when it comes to certain paywalls, but also it's like, you know, for, for blogs and stuff, uh, there, there has, you know, with, with podcasting, Patreon served the gulf of the sub 50,000 uh, or, or 100,000 download a month podcast. You know, the, for, for advertising, it doesn't really make sense less than that. And it makes even less sense as that market continues to fluctuate. Uh, but Patreon is like, oh, no, if you have 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 listeners per episode, like, yeah, th th if they all chip in a little bit, you can make a lot. And certainly with the there are few things that inspire, uh, uh, you know, the kind of daily interaction than certain blogs and uh, uh, websites that advertising only gets more and more annoying and commoditized by the day. But if I could just give them money, God, that'd be great. It'd be awesome. Yeah. And that's been, that's been the biggest thing holding back. And there was back in the nineties when they first were working on the spec for what would become World Wide web and all that, there was a lot of conversations about like, you know, building in tech that would make it easier to do micropayments. We're not doing it to go to go for the open web, which probably is why it grew so fast. And then you've had forever. I mean, you can, you know, you know, when our chat room, people are pointing out like there was flus, there's beans, and you could just go through a litany of all these attempts to try to create, you know, pseudo currencies or what have you. And then you've had, you know, stable coin as a concept, the idea of what about if you have a currency that's based on something. And then the most popular one, like Tether, was supposed to be based on like a basket of currencies. Then all of a sudden they're like, you know, like an African dictatorship started to change what they meant by valuation and stuff. Yeah. And it was maybe not so stable. And so here the idea is transparency. We know what it is, know what the value is. It's backed by large. The buy in is huge. For companies to participate in this but the goal is to get to the idea of like yeah here oh you want to read this new york times article click here it's 25 cents or whatever and you can't do a 25 cent transaction right now because 30 cents to do a credit card and then three or five percent of the fee there's just no money you can't for doing less than 40 50 cents or even doing a dollar you're giving 30 percent to those people doing it because of the overhead but <clears throat> i'm excited about the potential terrified that it's Facebook, but excited about the potential. Well, and, and man, if there was a way to divorce the fact that 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 the stated goal of the business that is doing this is to record all of my transactions and then use <laughs> that against me to make sure that I am perfectly targeted, selling that information to advertisers, like that is deeply problematic. And and in, and I in, in theory, it won't be Facebook. It will be Libra, in that there will be in theory a, there there will be a separation of this. Right. Sure. No, no, so no. It, from it, from it the reporting, be... after a year, this will basically turn over to the nonprofit, the Libra Association, where 27 additional partners will oversee the Libra and its development. Sure. But so... if you're logged in to Libra, my guess is you're also logged in to Facebook, which means that mm -hmm. Facebook still knows where you're going and what you're reading and what you're finding. Uh, you'd be able to use different partners to do it. But let me let me let me give you an alternative version of this. And that is. The problem with Facebook and Google is because they are ad they are, they are ad companies. They're ad companies that use technology to create a product that sells ad revenues. If Facebook says, you know what, we see an end towards there's only there's there is there I've looked at this before. There's the idea, there's the upper limit of how much you can how much advertising you can force on people before you just your your economy sort of collapses because nothing's going to generation a product or whatever. But at some point, you want to sell real things and you want to make money from real things being sold or whatever, or virtual, whatever. If Facebook says, you know what, we want to build a platform, we want to build the sales tools and the tools like that. So every time you click on the New York Times article, we're going to collect 10% or 20% of that. That's where we see our future revenue going through is actually selling you things instead of your attention. That's exciting because then they become more like Apple. You know, we, they, we're like, we're going to charge you a high price for this, but we're going to leave you the F alone. <laughs> yeah. I want that future. Yeah, I don't know that I believe in it. Uh, it's uh, because let's say they become a good actor 
that just opens I'm not up. Saying they're, no, I'm talking about what they're incentive. I'm not saying they're a good actor. Yeah. They're acting according to their incentive. No, no, no. Their incentive is get as much information about you as possible. Sure, sure. Uh, 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 you've not let me finish. Uh, even if they make a full swing into became, becoming a totally good actor, all that does is open up a slot for the next guys to be the bad actors. And uh, well, it's, it's a real I, bummer. Well, I mean, uh, yes, yes, of course. But my point is that, like, let's – Right now, advertising and violating our privacy and whatever is the th driving force because microtransactions, you can't, I can't do a blog post and make money by doing microtransactions right now. So I open it up to advertising, which becomes invasive in this thing. And sure. I'm not saying that people all of a sudden become good actors. I think that's naive. I think that what are their incentives? If their incentive is, I want to sell you a thing because I make more money by doing that than invading your privacy and, you know, you know their, their percentages are better then great. Like, I don't think Apple is any more moral than Facebook. Just Apple is in a wonderful business where they sell you the product and not try to make generate revenue off of it. Yeah, you know? I guess this feels, uh, to me, this feels uh, the closest analog I could think of is like uh, Amazon gift card dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like- um, As I say, cash. Uh, what, what's that? As, as we call it, my family, you know, cash. Well, and that's my point is when you could get just about everything you want on the Amazon store, then it pretty much is cash. Um, it's just, but of course, they at any point can cancel any of your cards and change their minds and and all of that stuff. Uh, it's not in their best interests to do any of that, but it it it's it's a smart move for Facebook. It's a it's probably a good frictionless way. Get ready for us to accept it at the scam stuff store. Uh, I I probably won't like it uh, in well will resent using it <laughs> at some so point. He, but here's here's the thing is that it, there already are plenty of players in the payment field, right? And uh, for everybody who is like, oh, it's it's flus or or these other older versions of it. If the time is right for this idea, then it will be forced to demonstrate its value for us to care about it. Because if it's in any way uh, not breaking ground, we already have plenty of ways that we can either pay each other directly via Venmo or PayPal or spend money online in increasingly frictionless, uh, frictionless ways like Apple Pay. Like we, we have – this is a very competitive space. So, Brian, uh, I think that the one thing that will be of a benefit for a currency like this is no matter where it's coming from and how long Facebook is stewarding it, it will have to sing for its supper or it will die. Well, the, remember, all the ones you mentioned there, they all have credit card cost overheads. Sure. You, you, you can't Venmo something for 25 cents or 30 cents without. You can't, you know, Apple Pay, all these things are limited by the idea of your, your bank content. account is the credit card. Where here it's the idea of, hey, I like this pod, I like this, this YouTube, I watched the first minute of this YouTube video. There's eight more minutes. Press this button to buy the rest for 50 cents, you know, but I don't have to put a bunch of money into a YouTube account to do that. Yeah, no, no. And that's and look, if that is how it works and that is uh, the, the way that people are taking advantage of it, then it will have sung for its supper. It will be worth it. It will. I will feel good about every time that I give because I won't think about Facebook. Brian won't think about Facebook. He'll think about, oh, great. My friend is getting this 50 cents. And then we will both text Ali Spagnola the next day and be like, hey, did you make $50,000 for the viral video that you had? Uh, because you wound up getting this uh, extra just passive cents uh, uh, that have kind of come in and we'll all feel good about it. And nobody will think about Facebook. So if it works, it will work. If it doesn't, it doesn't, which is, I guess, the dumbest possible uh, thing that I could say. Hey, uh, I, you know, I love my Oculus Quest. And I'm not consciously thinking I'm in the Facebook ecosystem when I use it, but I literally strap every day. I strap a device onto my head with four cameras <laughs> tracking my entire body movements that yeah. I don't know what's going on. And so Facebook's got me. I don't use Facebook itself, but. So uh, I got a uh, I got an independent creator qu qu question for you guys. Uh, we're in the middle of doing a thing that is very difficult to choose to do, but I think is very, very important. We've talked previously about the importance of building your email list. And now we're at the point where we are having to decide whether or not it's time to purge people from our email list. And how many people do you purge? And what are the qualifiers to purge? And what are the benefits? So um, I believe the main email list, this is the one that started off 
with uh, me handing out notebooks at every single stage show I did in the year 1999 forward and uh, began as like a 30,000 people touring list that turned out to really only be like 15,000 real emails um, that eventually became uh, giveaways that we would do every Friday on Scam, scam School, uh, everybody who purchased stuff. Um, and now we're, we're attempting to court a bunch of the audience from, uh, from the modern rogue, uh, that number got to a very impressive sounding 120,000, um, people, which feels really, really good. You feel like, wow, that's a lot of people I can reach. But the question is, uh, it, it turns out that as we've talked about before, those are really just like subscriptions on YouTube. Those are how many people who have given us emails. It's not an indicator of how many people are opening them. And uh, in general, when we would send something to 120,000 people, we could reliably expect uh, between 12 to 20,000 people to open that particular one. And you could hit them again. Maybe you caught them at the wrong time and they just slipped through. And then, you know, a similar number would hit it the second time. But when it came time to, it's like, okay, what is the value? Some number of these people are people who have not ever and will not ever uh, open any of the emails or read them. And in which case all you're doing is looking increasingly like a bad actor to the Gmails, the Yahoo mails, the hot mails yeah. out there. So we should purge. And so uh, I, I had a, 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 I had David call up a list. I was like, okay, we do about a campaign, an email campaign once a week. So in the last year, find how many people have not opened one single email. And I keep in mind, opening a single email, uh, not everything tracks exactly right because, you know, it uses inline images and ways and, and proxies basically to guess whether or not people are opening stuff. But we ended up that it was 40,000 emails that had not opened any of the previous 52 campaigns that we had sent out. And so we, we basically sent out an email uh, saying uh, uh, action required colon about the status of our friendship. And then it was a very simple text message that says, hey, uh, for whatever reason, MailChimp is under the impression, you know, maybe that, that, that you've not opened anything for the last year. If, if you're not digging it, uh, we're going to put you in uh, cold storage and you'll not be receiving new stuff. All you have to do is click on this image of a turtle and then we'll know that you're interested. Like, we're not buying anything. Just do you want to maintain this friendship? And yeah. we uh, out of the 40,000 emails, I think we got like 800 clicks the first time and around three or 4,000 opens. And then it was like, okay, well... I know we said that's going to be our last time just to be safe. Let's hit it again and got the same results the second time. And, uh, and that put us in a hard position because it's like, well, shoot, how many times could we keep doing this and getting you know, more and more people to at least click the, the turtle mm. to stay in and that will feel real good. And so ultimately what we did was, well, let, let's take this segment of 40,000 people and actually send them before we send it to everybody else. Let's send them their own segment of our newest product release. And if we sell even one, we'll know there's some value to that 40,000. And we did, and we sold absolutely nothing to that 40,000. Uh, and and uh, so, so now we're, we're in that position where it's like, man, I guess we got to, it, it feels real good to be able to say you have an email list of 120,000 people. It feels less good to say you have 80,000 people. But I think it's time for us to do that because... Uh, the the moment we switch to marketing only to that 80,000, Bonnie, for the first time in a year, got the email in her main feed and not in the promotions tab on Gmail. So it seems to have really made a difference. You know, that's I think that that that's segmenting. I would I would say what you did with segmentation is a great idea. And that's maybe the way to approach it today. I got an email from a magician who sells magic products, and I cannot recall ever clicking on anything he had. I clicked on it, opened on it, because he was selling, you know, a trick magic wallet or whatever, and I was thinking about getting something. And I looked at it, and I was the first time I ever recall doing that. And because I read the headlines, but I'm not in the mood. But like, I get Alex Ross, you know, who's the artist. I get his emails. I rarely open them. Every now and then I check the headlines. I'm not in the not looking to buy any Alex Ross right now. 
but I might be. So that's why I stay on his list. And I have, it's very easy to unsubscribe for these things now. And if I find myself on lists that I did not ask to be, I click unsubscribe or declare it spam. Um, I would say that what you did there segmenting is really the smarter way to do it is like try that because if you notice that difference, then that's super, super helpful because there is that, that, you know, we are, there are those whitelists and there are stuff and it is voodoo how it works. But man, like if I haven't, if I don't follow a number of things because, eh, oh, it's not Christmas time. I'm not buying anything. Like, oh, I, I wait every Christmas to buy this stuff, and they didn't have anything I wanted this year, but I'll get it next year. Well, and, and we've talked before about how even if nobody opens the email, what it does is it makes your subject line essentially a tweet where you grab mm-hmm. just a passing impression for them. So there is value in that, but we're having to weigh the value of that against the detriment of having a – eight percent open rate instead of a 16 percent open rate and and it is it is a finicky thing man uh uh we have battled it uh with the with the free political newsletter which is only you know a couple months old but uh even at about you know two thousand subscribers uh and it has about a 50 percent open rate this is not selling anything uh or at least very rarely it's primarily information uh every once in a while i'd say once every two weeks will fall into the promotions tab. And because we've kind of built up a culture of responding to the email, I'll know it every single time it happens because everybody will write in and say, this was in the promotions tab. This was in the promotions tab. Uh, uh, so it, it's, it's weird, man. Uh, I I'm, I'm with you, Brian. I think that that is the, the exact science of it is like, even if there's somebody that has the best intentions and they're just not looking at it or they have it in their mind that uh, eventually I'm going to come back to it you might have to just not send them that thing to make sure that more of the people that are of more of a qualified audience are definitely getting it. Yeah. But again, if you're using MailChimp, which is frustrating because, you know, they've changed the way they price and what they're doing. And I think sometimes they're overpriced on stuff. They've made it easier to segment. And sometimes segmenting is a way to separate and try to avoid, you know, having that happen. Sure. Um, And keep keep in mind, this is getting, we're getting ready to do a, um, we uh, created a, 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 a little piece of work that we're going to put on the, the Modern Rogue channel, and we're going to do a, a, a giveaway for the uh, Professional's Guide to Fire Eating. What is normally a $40 book or a $10 ebook, we're going to give away for free to anyone who signs up on the email list. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to nab some five-digit uh, new subscribers to the email because it's so, so important to separate those who are interested enough to participate in – uh, the parts of the offer operation that make everything else possible. And um, uh, knowing that we're courting an influx of more people, it does make sense. It's like, well, I mean, do we want to pay another hundred dollars a month just to keep, you know, objectively the, the, the bottom 30% uh, on this list, even though all it does is result in it being harder for everybody else to receive the emails and it's like it, it makes sense to to just and again I'm I'm not deleting them we're just putting them in cold storage and maybe at some point down the road you know there's some reason that we want to bring them back in but uh, but but for now you know outside of giving them two bits of warning and a, a stealth sales opportunity and and having people you know peace out on all three also having not opened the previous years worth of emails it's like we uh, you, you got to back away from those numbers that feel good and instead focus on you know, what's, what's, uh, what's what, for the greater good. Well, cause yeah. you, you, you gotta know what, what, what's the number that makes you feel the best, how many things you sell when you, when you push out an email. And so it's like, if, if this leads to more targeted, uh, people actually seeing the thing and they are actually going to pull out their, their credit cards and buy stuff, then that's the feel good number. Yeah. I think if it, if it's just calling a list for the point of calling a list, so the, the numbers go up, that's one thing, which that's not what you're arguing. You're saying that like we, we literally by cutting off 40,000 people and focusing on the ones that respond, you get in that new box. You, you're not you're not putting the promotions and all that. Sounds smart to me. Yeah, well, uh, we'll see. I'll let you know. <laughs> all I know. All I know is that it was a emotionally harder decision than I thought it would be. I, I thought I would be detached enough to be playing this like a uh, like a you know a game of Starcraft from a thousand foot view. But uh, when you're in the trenches and you're about to watch big numbers go to smaller numbers, that's that's a challenging thing. 
Yeah, but you you've you've done just about everything you could possibly do to decide if it's. I remember you talked about doing this before, and I was wondering because at that point it was just like it felt more like trying to get the number the return rate up. But I didn't really look at it in the light of like, hey, having thirty thousand people not open your emails means that it damages your reputation. Yeah, it it, yeah. it leaves like just as there's a secret YouTube algorithm. There's a secret email algorithm, and granted, it's it's 35 different bosses instead of just one, like the YouTube algorithm, but they're all generally playing by the same rules about what they allow to get through the gateway. Well, they, they all recognize the same positive behavior, which is opens, interactions, opening up new websites. Like These are all things that like they can control that you know the more we get of this, the better off we are doing. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, JC Calhoun says MailChimp addressing the emails to me is weird. He doesn't like it when uh, emails from Brian. First of all, they all are from me. Uh, I do get I uh, when they're more salesy. You could tell that that what usually happens is David writes a first draft, and I'm like, that's not how I talk, and then I I touch it a whole bunch. Uh, but uh, I I don't mind being spoken to directly. As, to me, the cost of admission to putting someone's name in there is that when you reply as if it is a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it is my job to reply back and continue the one-on-one -on -one conversation. The only way- He once to him that like when you say use his right. first name. Hey, yes. JC Calhoun. Yeah, correct, correct. I, I don't like that either. Uh, I don't uh, like that either. I don't, I don't, I've always, it stuff. always, cause I know it's a mass email and I know that they just inserted my name there and it's false intimacy and it just makes me feel, and... Oh, that's interesting. That's yeah. Yeah. I think it's I think... all, I've 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 opted to not do it on on the free political newsletter, but that's a different thing. Uh, but I, I do think I, I wrestled with it because on one hand, it's like I, the reason why I wound up not doing it is because if the if there is the chance that either they entered in something snidely or the you know the the their their first name that they entered into the form is you know too plug, formal or yeah, uh, and then <laughs> you now are revealing yourself to be. Like you failed their test of of intimacy. Yeah, I I won. Like when I see, because everybody knows how that works, and we get mil, you get you get several dozen emails a day. Like, hey Andrew, or hey this, whatever. I'm like, I from people we don't agree, and it it lumps those people in who use it with them. When I know when when somebody sends me a mass email that I agreed to, you're now in the same category as somebody who spanned me, who got my name. But if the thing that I like and what you do, Brian, is like. If somebody sends it to me and they sign their name, if somebody responds to those emails that I send out, you know, just tell I just say hello, blah blah blah. I respond to every damn one of them, and you do that too, and right. and, and sure Justin does. I respond to every even if it's like cool, thanks, whatever. And when somebody responds, if I get an email from Brian, and I know if I email Brian, Brian will reply to me. Dude, your your status with me is infinite, you know. Yeah. And that's what I try to do with people is if I sign my name at the bottom, you I bet if I sign my name at the bottom and I send it to you. That's my way of intimacy is if you reply to me, I'll say hello. Oh, no, I, I, I start every morning. Every morning I'll have uh, – I'll probably get around 20 to 30 emails a day per free political newsletter. And that's my morning is there's usually the 15 that come in the morning and then the 15 that come throughout the day. And so the morning is just me answering all those people that like they, – they are the hardcores. Like they – wake up every morning and usually a lot of them are on the East coast and they read the newsletter and they respond to me. And I, that is very important to me <laughs> to make sure that we are of a, like, no, we have a relationship. You send me your thoughts and I send you my thoughts. That's very important. Yeah. yeah. Somebody said here like, Hey, the name of the email helps you know that it's not random spam. Like I got news for you. Um, I get a lot of random spam from people who got my name. <laughs> Apparently, um, people have some videos of me doing unspeakable things. I need to give them BitCurrent. Bitcoin <laughs> right now. BitCurrent. <laughs> Bitcoin. It's the new thing. Um, yeah. uh, you guys want to do picks? Yeah, man, I got a pick. Uh, you ever see a trilogy that wraps everything up perfectly and you think, why on earth are they making more movies? That thing was all wrapped up. Uh, but then you watch it and you're like, oh, it turns out there are more stories. Uh, that's Toy Story 4. Pretty great. Sweet. The... Uh, uh uh, uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll do unspoilerage, which uh, the concerns that I had going into it is please don't undo what was great about that whole first trilogy. Please don't be milking 
stuff for more money. Uh, it doesn't seem to be doing any of those things. They they genuinely discovered another story. Um, it, it, it felt like a retirement story. It, it, it's like, you know, what happens after ha happily ever after you have a much lower stakes, interesting story. Uh, after your kids grow up and go to college, then uh, it turns out that you still have relationships and friends. And yes, it's mainly about bridge, but it's still you could tell a really good story about a bridge tournament in a retirement home. Uh, cool. Uh, I'm going to pick. I watched uh, uh, Fire in the Maternity Ward by Anthony Jeselnik. It's a, he's a stand-up comedian. Uh, I don't I have no idea how he has a career in 2019. <laughs> like is like he is he is the walking uh, a human embodiment of a dead baby joke uh, down to the fact that all he tells like a solid 15 minute of dropping a baby jokes uh, and pretty much every hot button issue that you might imagine, including, uh, you know, race and religion and uh, abortion is where he plays. All the jokes are uh, uh, indicative of uh, very mean and, uh, uh, you know, kind of a uh, thought behavior, but they're well-told jokes. Uh, so I enjoyed it. Uh, he is, he is a, a, a curious, a curious career in the year of our Lord, 2019. There's a, I mean, we go like, man, I'm glad or amazing this guy has a career that all of a sudden they cross a boundary, then they don't, you know, there's a, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm again, I'm, I'm, I'm in, in awe of him as a, as a joke teller. Uh, apparently he came, I, I was listening to an interview with him. He came very, 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 very close to taking the weekend update desk, hmm. uh, like two years ago. And they decided to keep, uh, Michael Che and Colin Jost on uh, to see whether or not they would, uh, uh, you know, be able to pick up some steam, which I guess they have. But uh, that would have been an interesting play because I don't yeah. know if if the modern world of uh, a Saturday Night Live uh, exists in the same way. If he's he would have been far more in the Norm Macdonald vein of like trying to pick fights uh, with that. Bully bully. Yeah, and speaking of which, no word on a season two of Norm Macdonald has a show, which I loved because. Oh yeah, yeah, with his interview show, right? The Netflix yeah. original one. Was that yeah. a weekly oh. release thing? Because I think Netflix was trying that for. No, no, it was like. Oh, was they it? They just did like eight or ten or whatever, and mm -hmm. and then the idea is a seasonal thing. Oh, okay. Um, he's a weird. Okay. I mean, he's a weird interviewer. I I I I love Norm Macdonald, uh, and I thought some of the episodes were really good. But like, there's a part of you're never really able uh, able to escape the Norm vortex. But uh, yeah, no, I, I would I, I would say uh, it, it is a very if you've never heard of Anthony Jeselnik, uh, please be prepared. He is uh, he is there to offend you. Uh, I got to pick. Um... Last week was my birthday, and it also just happened hey. to be uh, the same day that a new studio album from this band that I really like came out. Um, it's called 834.194 uh, from the band I Second was, Action. I was uh, about to make some joke about what unpronounceable name is it, Bryce. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, it, and it was. Um, hey, well, read off those track titles for us, will you? Sure. Uh, the first one up here is Wasudata and I Know. Uh, the second one is Machito Peanuts. I can keep going. Yeah, no, I, uh, by the way, because there's oh, I have, oh? I have a present I'm going to have to send you. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, but uh, it, this is cool. I've talked about them on the show, I think, last year. Um, they have a very cool, like, uh, they're, they're a rock band, but they do electronic sort of stuff. Actually, it wasn't until I shared a link to one of the songs uh, on, I think, the Scam Nation Discord where um, uh, someone was like, oh, that's kind of like, that's kind of disco-y. And there is definitely like a retro vibe to to this album, but I didn't I, I hadn't put that together. But uh, it's very cool. It's it's a mix of like driving sort of rock stuff, but also like do, do they have like those orchestral hits the way disco used to? Or uh, a little bit here. This is a little bit of uh, their title track. What's your daughter Kind of like a yeah. It's got it's got like a retro pop, like a bit of a bit of a funk rhythm. Yeah. Uh, does feel I, I can see it like a chrome polish 77 yeah 
so it's uh, it, and so it's kind of a mix between you know a, a little bit of the retro stuff, some some harder rock stuff, a lot of down tempo stuff, uh, which is not always my always my speed, but it's very cool, and it's on streaming now. Eight three four dot one nine four just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> Uh, Bryce, I showed you this, right? What's that? Uh, oh, no, The Naturalist! That? Is that oh, in Japanese? Yeah, it's a Japanese cover. Oh, of how cool. Seo Kude. Yeah. Very cool. Dude, uh, want awesome. one? Very nice. Uh, yeah, he asked if you want one. You would, oh, please. Yeah. I love it. He, he, he didn't respond, Brian. So I, just <laughs> <figured it was. laughs> I, could, I couldn't let that just drop <laughs> on the ground, man. <laughs> we had a... Yeah. Yeah, they did that. I got another. I've got uh, another edition of it. Did I show you the one with the actual tears on the cover? No. no. Oh, all right. Like a, like, all right. Okay. Right. 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 Uh, yeah. So, audio listeners, uh, you're watching. Edit bit out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. dope. So, oh, that's yeah, great. Uh, there, there are actual uh, oh, holes it, in the cover. Yeah, and die cut holes. Claw marks. That's it's awesome. Cut through. That's great. Is that an Italian version too, O Naturalista? Uh, this is the Brazilian edition. Ooh, um, so what's cool is if you take the one with the Japanese cover, which has a grizzly bear on it, yeah, and you put it next to this one, uh -huh. hmm, oh. I wonder if we have a suspect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, it could be. A... Don't look at the two covers together. <laughs> it's it's way more than that. It's, it's not the most it's Andrew thing ever, creating an extended universe out of his own foreign language book cover copies. <laughs> I didn't do it. They did. I just. It's funny because I got the claw mark one day, and the next day I get a cover of the bear on it. I'm like, well, if you put these two together, it's kind of like a spoiler time. <laughs> it's, 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 it's kind of like you're in the first chapter of who they think did it. <laughs> <laughs> that uh my pick is um scrivener scrivener they've i think they've updated it and uh any mac users out there by the way i think uh, the new i've been on catalina for a while just a cool and scrivener works great on the new os scrivener is my tool for writing um when i write a book scrivener is my typewriter scrivener is where it all comes together and people periodically ask me do i recommend anything and it's like yes i don't use anywhere nearly all the features but I'll tell you one feature I use a lot is uh, you ever write a story and you're like, I need a name. Oh yeah, sure. How about Ken Gibbons? Uh, that seems like a name that I wouldn't have thought of, but uh, How about Eden that's a Churchill. Did you think of that one? Uh, uh, no. I think what you're getting at is my deepest fear when it comes to naming is that it will reveal some kind of cultural bias that I don't know that I have. And How about if, if hip, no. If we could double blind that, that would be amazing. So let me give you a. Uh, this is got a name you can, generator. You can select all the different kinds of names. Like I just clicked the Japanese. Oh. So let's see if I get any Japanese names who come up here. Um, uh, no, because there are none. Um, <laughs> no, but they, it will do. No, it does actually. They just passed one here. So anyhow, you can choose different names. You can choose like Polish surnames, British surnames. You can just click all of them so you create and avoid exactly what you talked about, Brian. Like I, I probably pick the same three vowels and consonants over and over again when I want to name names. Right. But this is wonderful. Very cool. Name generator. Yeah. It's like I have a little box here and you can say like I, I just told it to generate like 500 names. So just oh literally God. generate Carl Wat Watanabe. <laughs> Oh, wow, and know? this looks like you can set like obscurity and uh, mm -hmm. add different lists. That's very cool. So that's part of Scrivener. It's one of the many, many features in there, and it is a super, super useful feature because you don't want to be staring at a blank screen trying to come up with a name. Yeah. Although I've had people reach out to me like, hey, I'm a cop, and you used had a cop with my name. Why did that happen? I'm like, blame Scrivener. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, you do get uh, plausible deniability as well. <laughs> that's another benefit. Yep. Yep. So, gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been after. Yeehaw. Yes, indeed. Cool. All right, fam. Well, I'm going to go grab me some lunch. I'll see you guys later. Ditto. Me too. XOXO. Love you guys. Bye, guys. Bye.